uh, on this uh, because I just think that the the option which is somehow the official or, or unofficial or otherwise that well um, I will be meet virtual and so on is causing problems. Um, I think the virtual arrangement was a COVID induced uh, arrangement. We are past that now. Uh, there's a semblance of normality uh, about. Um, and so I want to really apologize to, to colleagues for the change to had to effect, but at the same time, it, I just, it would have been way wasteful for members that we go to M446, we meet together, and then that's it, because I feel that if we want to be in Cape Town, then we must be there the full week uh, uh, as well, particularly also on the limitation of that. So colleagues, my apologies on, 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 on that front, but I think we can talk about it when we have our own family meeting and tie down on arrangements, but I will be engaging the House Chair. So good morning, colleagues, and welcome. Let me take this opportunity now to welcome the Minister of Employment and Labour and his team, uh, Compensation Fund, the Commissioner, um, who are here. So what we'll do, uh, Minister, we'll, we'll hand over to you to give us the update of how far things are. Um, and then we will then pose questions. And then say, uh, colleagues, we've got National Treasury at half past 11. Um, they sent an email yesterday at six, uh, one minute past six to be exact, uh, to say that their presentation will only be available this morning. Uh, up to now, I've not received it, unless it has come through to the Secretariat, but seated here now, the last communication one has that I'm aware of is from last night at one minute past six to say they will send the presentation this morning for this morning's meeting. So just in case there's any questions about why National Treasury is, has not submitted. All right, so that's that update. So when Recording we in here, progress. We will then proceed to to, to, to the minister, and it's why we're starting at nine, or supposed to start at nine, because we've got two meetings today. So, uh, Minister, can I hand over to you to make your, your opening remarks and then get to your presentation and then we'll full questions. So, colleagues, good morning and welcome. Minister, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair and members of the SCOPA. Am I audible, sir? Uh, yes, you hear me? yes you, you are audible, perfectly audible. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Chair and members of SCOPA. The Deputy Minister and the Director General are representing the department in an EU meeting in Spain. Hence, we have today the acting DG Sam Morotoba. Let me recognize the commissioners of the UIF and the CF and their teams and ladies and gentlemen. And thank you to SCOPA for affording us this opportunity. And this is the second SCOPA hearing into the two funds and the previous occasion being on uh, the 6th of September this year. I take this to be a measure of how serious uh, the shortcomings of the funds have been, as well as the seriousness with which SCOPA views these matters. From my side, as the executive authority, I've always said I value the oversight of parliament of ourselves as the executives and officials. And I always assure you my total cooperation even if it's tough. The officials of the funds will provide the detailed progress on corrective measures being implemented, both in terms of their clean audits projects and audit readiness, as well as on longer term 
uh, what we call architecture review project to address the underlying systemic challenges. Also, the commissioners have provided detailed responses to SCOPA questions in respect of uh, the unlisted investments, ongoing litigation, consequent management, and in relation to the UIF progress report on efforts to validate COVID-19 terrorist payments to recover wrongful payments, as well as subsequent uh, cases. I just want to flag the following. Annual reports have been submitted late to Parliament for, for two years running. This is very critical part or a very critical part of the progress reports from entities, as well as the efforts towards audit readiness for 22-23. And I want to say, you, you must not spare us on this one. We need to give a plausible explanation. And Scopa will want to see that the issue of inadequate documentation and record keeping is thoroughly addressed. This is one of the repeat findings responsible for poor audit outcomes. This particular shortcoming does not require teams of high-powered accountants to run it, but it does require a complete change in the work culture and systems of the financial controls of the funds. And I think even here, you don't need to spare us. The officials must answer, why can't we do the basic things? Scopa will see that there is no shortage of well-laid plans. There is evidence of progress made. But Scopa will be concerned at the pace of implementation and the fact that we have not yet reached the critical momentum in this process. And I share that concern and have called even a session of the management of both entities with the AG, and I want the whole management, including the middle management, to talk about or to address this matter. And uh, this idea of consequent management, we start, I'm starting to be very harsh, but I'll leave it to them to explain and uh, thank you again, Scopa, for this opportunity. I will request uh, the UIF maybe to start. Thank you, Chairperson and members. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Minister, for the, those comments. Um, good morning to the UIF and welcome to you. Uh, UIF, let's hand over to you. Um, Commissioner, I don't think we can hear you. Minister and um, member of the standing committee. I'm hoping maybe you just can. Proof of lunch, eh? Maybe you can keep your camera off because I think we're betting to hear you. It's fine. We've got your proof of life. Okay. And yeah, perfect. Can you hear me now? Much better, yeah. Thank you, sir. Babushan, <coughs> uh, uh, please pardon me. Uh, my, my voice is, is, is a bit strained, so I'm just recovering from flu, but I think I'll pull it through. Uh, uh, Babu Mafata will be fighting the slides for me. That Mafata, we can start... I'll, I'll, I just want to start on slide two, Mr. Mafat. If I can just be given the hosting rights. Okay. Okay, let me just locate your name. Thank you. 
Are you sorted, Mr. Mafata? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Mafata. Uh, if you go to slide number two. <clears throat> Uh, Chair, what we are highlighting here are the areas that we are going to be covering. Um, we've tried as far as possible, Chair, to cover the question that we raised and also cover progress. As you can see, we have priorities. We have the Clean Audit Project. We are also highlighting uh, the reasons of non-submission of the annual financial statements. And we also give you the, 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 the committee a feel of uh, the work that we, we, are, we are doing with the, second, the seconded company that has been seconded to us to help us. And then there's an issue that we raise around the unlisted investment portfolio on the performance, the size, the amount, and the companies. We've covered that area. We also bring feedback around COVID test verification. Um, the issue raised around contract management as it links to irregular expenditure, and we just want to give the committee comfort that we put together a process that, that aligns uh, how we are going about. Uh, issues were raised around uh, service delivery and questions that were, were brought in about uh, long queues, uh, customers submitting uh, claims and taking long to provide services. We are covering that area. We also want to, to give the committee comfort in terms of our audit readiness as we've committed to submit by the 31st of March. Uh, the committee raised issues around the SIU investigations. We've covered that area also to, to highlight some of the, to, to highlight the, um, the charges that were met on, on an individuals and also the final verdict. And also some of the feedbacks in particular on some of those cases that at the time of coming to the committee were still outstanding. We also are giving the committee feedback around the, the regular expenditure especially because it was a, a, an issue raised previously that we're taking long to investigate and we're giving the committee feedback on, on the case that were uh, subjected to investigation and where we are with those investigation. And I think it's also of interest to the committee about the COVID test investigations that we're doing with the HOGS, SIU, and the Fusion Center and where we are in terms of convictions, uh, the court cases. We're also covering... Um, the issue around organizational ar architecture. I think the committee has raised several times that there's issues around ICT processes, and the minister took it upon himself to 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 drive a project to to do a renewal of the two institutions. And to that extent, the PwC was appointed to help us to renew, and they, they they've been given 18 months uh, to give us a turnaround plan, which is happening by next year. And then we'll, we'll cover on, on the progress of making the call center. <clears throat> and Dadima Fadi, if you can maybe then go to slide number five. Yes. Chair, I, I thought, let, let me start with this slide, just to give a committee a feel that um, as, as URF, there's areas that keep us awake at night that, that bothers us as an institution. The first one is a negative report around our, our investments. In particular, is the unlisted investments that for a number of reasons are making to the paper in terms of how money is spent and how the, invest, the portfolio is performing. We are equally concerned as an institution and uh, we are taking steps to deal with that. We are, we are also concerned with, with delays implementation of the follow the money project with respect to COVID tests. Uh, our, our concern in the main was emerging from the fact that we were challenged in court by one of the service providers, but we have since made progress. So there's good stuff coming out of the, the Follow the Money project. The late submission of annual financial statements remained a problem for us in our concern. And to an extent that um, we are putting together an action plan just to make sure that the subsequent years, we don't have to deal with the same problem. Liquidity of the fund remains an issue. <clears throat> I think in the main, the liquidity of the fund, not that it's a problem. We have seen an increase in the number, in the, in the amount of um, contributions that we are receiving from companies, but we are not in the same position we were in, 20, in, 20, in, the, in March 2020, when we were sitting at 160, 264 billion rands. Now we are sitting at just over 125 billion rands. And so our view is that we need to uh, start driving towards having a stronger financial muscle. Poor customer experience is still a problem that we are concerned about. And, and our view is that all of these facts are together, they bring 
they bring to light a poor image of the fund, that they, 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 the fund is seen in a negative light. To this end, Chair, the Dimafade on slide seven. <clears throat> on slide seven, Chair, we've put together 12 priority areas that we believe uh, these, these 12 priorities are going to help us to turn things around the URL. It's a focus. The performance of the institution is concerning. So it's a priority for us. We're putting concerted effort to drive it. I think the last time we were here, Chair, there were issues raised around information technology and what is that we're doing to turn around the ICT environment at, at UIF and both compensation fund. And that's a, a focus for us. Uh, fruitless and wasteful and irregular expenditure remain a concern, <clears throat> in particular how quickly we resolve um, cases that are that has been picked up, but also the speed at which disciplinary processes are, are undertaken to close the gaps, but also how quickly we deal with the control environment to make sure that um, these fruitless and wasteful and irregular expenditure are prevented and don't happen again. Mm -hmm. And the, the fund image as well. I, I think the one issue that I want to lift up of interest for the committee is also the fraud and risk management. Uh, that um, the, the speed at which we, we resolve cases, uh, even though it's not at the level that we want it to be, but there's an improvement in terms of resolving cases and making sure that we take the necessary steps in terms of discipline. Uh, with COVID tests, I'm going to also work members on what we are doing around COVID tests and then clean audit. Uh, uh, I'm not going to, to spend time on slide 8, slide 9, slide 10, 11, 12, 13, <coughs> up to slide 19, Chair. Now, on this slide, what we are providing to the committee is a progress we are making on each, in, on, on each, of, on each and every one of the... 12 priorities, the activities that we've undertaken and where we are on each activity, we're just giving an update that this is the things that, the activities that we've planned, and this is where we are. A majority of them are in green, there are some that are in ember, but it, we are generally making progress on the 12 priorities. Um, now I'm going to shift and focus on the things that um, are of interest for the committee. Uh, that's the, the clean audit, and that might the slide 20. Or maybe just go straight to slide 21. Uh, Chair, on, on this slide, what the, what the slide is reflecting is the 2021-2020-2021 uh, final audit opinion and the audit picture. Now, as you can see, the, the area of emphasis, we received a, a qualified audit opinion. Uh, what the auditor is, is, is revealing to us is that the quality of submitted financial statements remains a, a concern um, for them. The financial health, as I've indicated, in a sense that we are not where we were in 20, in 20, in March 2020. Our financial position has reduced to just over 120 billion rands as compared to 160. Uh, information technology remains a concern. They were equally concerned about audit action plans, uh, IT governance. I think the minister did touch on the issue around proper record keeping. We are going to be speaking to that and processes and reconciling controls, they've raised that, and ICT systems controls and risk management. So these were the issues that the auditors raised. But I think I want to bring to attention to slide 22. <coughs> and that's my slide 22. I think, Chair, what I want to lift up in this slide is in 2016-17, you have received a disclaimer audit opinion. And the reason for the Tislima audit opinion in 2016-17 was the, the investment portfolio, which affected the cash flow and how we, are, we had accounted for in our financials. So in the main 2016-17, the problem were the investments. In 2017-18, we, we, we had an aggressive action plan with the PIC working together month on month. And the audit opinion has changed just in, in 12 months that we moved immediately within 12 months to an un unqualified audit opinion. I think what I'm trying to emphasize here is if PIC does what um, is expected and the university companies give what is expected, it's quite easy to move from a disclaimer to, un to unqualified audit opinion. But if you look in the subsequent year, 1819, the issue 
that came in 1819 was the issue of investments and how we had an accounted for the investment portfolio. You go to 1920, same issue, it's investments, uh, but, but the team took a, a different accounting treatment for, for provision and subsequent events. And then there were, there were two new findings, which was a COVID test, because we were paying COVID tests for the first time in the, in the financial year 2020. And at, at that time, we had not um, followed up every single cent. We were still in the process of payment. But if you look at 2020, 2021, again, is the investments. Investments, investment in property, and all of this affects the cash flow of the fund. The other areas in red, these are our new findings for UIF because these are uh, the COVID related. For example, the, the receivable from non exchange, this is the money that was transferred to UIF by companies as a result of the court cases and the investigation that were happening. Companies just dumped money into UIF account without giving us any detail. And therefore, we're not able to trace, to track and trace where the money is coming from. But now we've been able to secure, we are on the brink of securing a letter from information regulator so that we can extract information of these companies via the banks, the full details. But the, the banks can only give us the, the information if the information regulator give us permission to extract that information from the banks. And the rest of the items I speak to <coughs> a COVID test. And then, Radima Fadi, if you can go to slide 24. Oh, Chair, what I want to highlight here are the, the issues that were raised uh, per, per audit item now. That was issue around um, the benefit payments, the auditor being unable to verify accuracy of the test expenditure. This is the 64 billion rents that we've paid 64 billion rents, but the auditor is not able to say, Yes, Commissioner, you've paid 64 billion rands, but did it reach the individual South Africans? And to this end, um, this is the, the project that we've undertaken with the follow the money team that I'm going to unpack um, later on. We also have a receive, a receivable, and once again, this is the area of no controls to identify test over payments. Uh, these are the payments I, I've made reference to earlier with companies paying money to the account and without the, the necessary documentation. The unlisted investment portfolio is our nightmare with myself and conversation fund. This, uh, this is a problem with the portfolio, but I'll unpack it in the uh, subsequent slide. Uh, but here we are engaging with, with uh, National Treasury and also the accounting standard period to, to see how best can you treat this investment portfolio. Because at this stage, our approach is that we, we use GRAP 104, which is the impracticality standards to account for the financials, but we have not found each other with AG. We've developed a technical opinion on how we can treat uh, these investing companies and the financials that we're receiving from them. We've, we've given it to AG to review, but that's under discussion. Um, we, are, we are also securing a meeting with um, National Treasury to discuss that matter. <coughs> And then benefits, uh, payments, uh, um, uh, slide 25, Nadima Fata. Yes, I, I think with the regular expenditure here, Chair, we've made progress. Um, I, I think I've indicated earlier, but what, what we've made progress here that all, all the irregular expenditure have now been finalized, investigation done. We've already started the process of um, uh, uh, of uh, the disciplinary or consequence management. Uh, with lab non-compliance, we've also attended to this. Uh, we've conducted an analysis on the pr principal agent requirements in terms of PFMA, we've developed a, an SOP. Uh, in terms of the prepayment process, we've also developed and performed a prepayment reconciliation to make sure that all the prepayments are, are linked to deliverables and uh, that has been uh, done. And we've also developed a neutralized commitment register and a prepayment checklist. So in terms of the other areas, um, we believe that those areas have been covered. The only area that uh, remains a challenge is with COVID tests. Uh, slide 27, Dr. Mafat. <coughs> now, on slide 27, Chair, now, uh, here we are highlighting the action that we've taken with respect to our investment. 
Uh, we've consulted with uh, various stakeholders in terms of the accounting treatment of an unlisted portfolio. I think the key here is the National Treasury, the accounting general, because these are the people who develop the accounting standards. We are engaging with them to make sure that the, the technical opinion that we've developed to treat these unlisted investments is actually um, credible. As, as I said, we've also given it to Auditor General to apply themselves and also to their technical team to see if we cannot find each other. I think in the meeting that we'll be having with the minister, we'll also um, be engaging with, on, on, this, on, on this issue as well. <clears throat> and then we've also developed a, de a detailed review procedure on in terms of accounting treatment for management accounts. I'm going to show in later slides that some of the investing companies, they, they have not been able to give us audited financial statements and they're not been able to give us interim uh, financial statements. As a result, they, they've, 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 been, they've given us management accounts. We've developed a treatment instruments to treat these management accounts. But more often than not, when we're looking at these management accounts, we've picked up gaps and we've sent back these, these management accounts to the PIC to close the gaps in the management accounts. Because once you plug them into in our financials, we are saying to the public and AG that we've satisfied ourselves that the finance, the finances we are receiving from these companies are credible, but there's still a number of them that are, are not um, uh, meeting our treatment mechanism. We, we've reviewed the unlisted investment mandate. Um, in the main, we're trying to make sure that we close the gaps that has been troubling us for the past years. And I think the risk here, um, members, that concerns myself and Vuyo is that the unlisted portfolio is intended to, to create jobs. And the risk of the review is that we may withdraw in a portfolio that creates jobs and compromise the very mandate of creating jobs in the interest of having a, a clean audit. So that's the, the balancing act that we are navigating in terms of reviewing the mandate and make sure that you continue to invest in employment creation without uh, compromising our ability to submit credible financial statements at the end of financial years. We've also um, worked on governance. Uh, unfortunately, the Deputy Minister of Finance is, is the chairperson of the PIC board, and there's been constant engagement with the Deputy Minister at ministerial level, at the chairperson level, and also we've instituted board-to-board -board engagement, investment committee to investment committee, uh, and these meetings are, are slowly beginning to, to bear fruits, but they're not bearing fruits at the pace that enable us to to submit credible financial statement at the at the required time. Uh, <clears throat> my father, if you can go to slide twenty nine. Uh, Chair, what I'm highlighting here is, is the actions we've taken with respect to COVID test expenditure and the controls to ensure that we have. We have valid, accurate, and complete information with respect to TES. Now, on, on one hand, there were overpayments. Now, these overpayments resulted from companies applying for staff that were either working for half a day or were working during the periods, or they used uh, incorrect amount. We've developed a test recovery process. There's an accounting treatment that has been developed. And we've also identified the possible companies that are owing us and there's a there's a, a debt collection company that has been uh, brought in on board already about uh, six months ago. That is also ensuring that we follow up on every single company that owes us. And there's an, an, an acknowledgement of debt. There's a process that has been put in place for the company to start paying back uh, the money that is due to URF. The other area is the, re, the refunds accounting treatment. Now, this is the area where companies have dumped 2.4 billion rands into the coffers of URF. Uh, and now here, we are using a tracking and traces, a track and trace process to start and tracking each transaction. But where we're not able to find the name of the company, um, we've already engaged the information regulator so that we can take that, the account number, trace it back through the, the banking industry to get the, the details of the company and pursue them. Um, if it needs to be, some of them we may have to, to, to pursue them either criminally or uh, start the process of investigation. And then we also are, are reconciling uh, some of the, the, the funds 
that has been put forth, the specification drafted on an integrate, uh, integrating process. But I think here, we've also found a shortcut to, to the integration. Instead of integrating the system, we, we are, we'll be able now to extract data from one system and, and, and dump it on, on the financial system and just run a recall. And from there, being able to, to reconcile. Now, with respect to follow, follow the money, our, our greatest struggle with follow the money was the court case that was before URF. We could have easily appointed the follow the money team already in April, but the, the court case took a bit long. And once a case is, is before court, it is not uh, advisable for us to pursue uh, going through the process of appointment if we have not ensured that uh, we've closed all the gaps in terms of uh, the court case. But uh, we, we've now moved on. We've appointed six service providers. We may be appointing the seventh one. And um, they've already started their work <clears throat> on, on to follow the money on the project. Uh, the other uh, good thing is that we also engaged um, the banks. The, bank, the first bank that we've engaged so far, they, they'll be able to confirm 27% of the 62.4 billion rents that we've paid, which will eat up a chunk of, of the money. But we're also in the process to engage the rest of the banks such that we are able to confirm quicker uh, the, the, the remaining money. Uh, and then, Chair, in slide 30, <coughs> I'll only focus slide 30, Mr. Mafat. I think on, on this slide, I'll, I'll focus on TIA, which is the investment area. I, I, I think here yeah, the progress that we want to give, Chair, is that uh, for, for all the, um, those that are classified as associate, we've already equity accounted for them, especially where we've received uh, audited financial statements. Where companies were, o were only able to give us um, management accounts and draft financial information, we, we have reviewed those, we have equity accounted them uh, based on the accounting treatment that we've developed. We've drafted a consultation memo in terms of treating those that are in, li in liquidation or business rescue. And that's the technical memo that we are engaging with um, AG to able to able to find each other, but the accounting treatment of, of these companies. Um, we've secured a meeting with ASB and National Treasury so that we can have a final view in terms of how we treat the unlisted portfolio so that we know that this problem is resolved once and for all and hence we are engaging the drafters of the of the craft standards so that moving forward at least the, the treatment moving forward has been attended to now in, in, in invest investees that are under administration <coughs> we have reclassified them into crap 104 in particular because most of these companies that are under administration they're not able to put together either management accounts or or interim financial statement or even audited financial statements. They are under administration and their focus is to get is to get out of the of the woods. And we are still pursuing Grab 104 to say it is it is impractical for us to receive credible financial records from these companies or fin credible financial management accounting from these companies. Um, one of the findings that we received last year was the valuation reports. And in the main here, what, what the auditor general was concerned about was a, a line that where the, the review of the of the valuation reports was not owning up to the report. In saying there was a line that says um, they don't own up to the report, and we are saying to the PIC, we cannot have this line because it, the owners of the report are not owning up to how they've evaluated this investment. If we are plugging in five billion dollars in our account, we should be able to have records that reflects how we arrived at, at that amount. And hence, you would find the, the AG is saying there's an issue of record keeping. The record keeping is with respect to these investing companies that we are struggling with to get financial statements. We've already prepared prior year period adjustment journals to resolve the prior findings. So those journals have been prepared and they'll be pulled through. We've developed working papers for review of, of valuation reports and management account and accounting policy. Now, all of these, because the, the main focus is on the investment portfolio, this is hence these action plans that we've put in place and this development that we have here. Uh, Chair, I want to move to slide 31. <coughs> uh, 
No, I think, Chair, I, I've covered slide 31, Dr. Mafad, you can go to slide 32. <coughs> Chair, what you're highlighting here is, is a journey uh, towards um, delivering the, the account by the 31st of March as planned. So well, this is the project plan. <coughs> Uh, I think I want to actually simplify this. And Adima Fad, if you can just go to slide 37, I think it's much easier. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mafad. Uh, what I'm unpacking here, Chair, I, I, I'm reflecting the areas that are completed in terms of phases. Even though in, in the previous slide, what I was showing was the timelines leading to uh, our delivery on the 31st of March. In terms of phase one, the work that we've done um, with, with the experts that we've brought on board was we, we brought them up to speed in terms of them understanding the processes and pulling together. We, we analyzed the audit findings, we analyzed the risk, and then we designed the to be process and closed all the, the necessary gaps that we have picked up. Uh, we did a grab checklist to make sure that for each grab standards, that will apply for each financial record. We've developed a checklist that you can tick as, as we are completing each activity, we're able to tick per, per grab standard. And then in phase two, we dealt with disclosure notes, the accounting policy and the grab standards. And the areas that are listed there are all the areas that has been covered. TIA is a key one where, we've, where we had issues in terms of investments. There were findings in labor activations, we've closed those. Uh, in revenue, reporting, operations, supply chain, we, we've completed that area. So we've already dealt with the disclosure notes, accounting policy, and the craft standards. And then in phase three, <clears throat> we've already closed the gaps on the cash flow notes. Um, uh, quality assurance has started. And also the an annual financial statement project plan, we've put that together in terms of the, the time frames. Now, the, the area that we are still busy with now, between now, and December are the investee companies where we still have information that is outstanding. And also to continue with our regular meetings with AG. Um, we, we've also uh, plugged in all the findings are recorded in our online platform, we call it Ad Tracker, where we put every single audit finding and each, each finding owner can go onto the platform and update their, their findings and uh, put evidence. So that even when AG or internal audit come to, to, to track where we are with the individual audit finding, they, they just need to go into the platform and they, they're able to track each, each finding in the platform. Uh, Chair, I just want to go to slide 42, uh, just managing time now. Uh, in, in slide 42, this is just a, a detail, a project plan on, on the things that have, has been done, uh, that, that has been completed. The areas that are, are, are in Ember are the areas that I, I've covered earlier about with respect to, con, to the, the recon between the financial and, and, and operational uh, um, system, uh, especially those, those, those funds that were where companies, there were overpayments or underpayments due to companies either using uh, uh, incorrect salaries for their employees or um, lifting up their salaries when, at, at the time of applying. And, and we, we finally re, uh, are reconciling that. Uh, I think the, the other area that is, is of concern for us is consolidation of recoveries from the external law and enforcement. I'm going to unpack in, in the subsequent slides on <clears throat> these areas where money has been recovered by SIU, money has been recovered by asset, asset forfeiture units and other uh, law enforcement agencies but we need to reconcile these financials and plug them into our financials. Uh, and that's the area that uh, remains outstanding. So if you go to slide 44, this is just now uh, timelines with dates <coughs> uh, uh, leading up to the 31st of March, um, I I including submitting to internal audit by the 10th of January. So the internal audit is given time to review our financials. So this is the breakdown of the timelines leading to the 31st of March. Uh, I want to now go to slide 48 and talk to the unlisted portfolio. Maybe just go straight to slide 49, that's my fault. 
Yeah, um, I will request that we move with a particular speed because we still have to engage compensation fund and your presentation is some 111 slides. So if you could, uh, without losing the salient points, uh, uh, move with a particular speed, please. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, in slide 49, Chair, what I'm highlighting is just the, the breakdown of the unlisted portfolio. Um, I think the, portfolio, the committee had requested last time to give us, to give an amount, uh, I think this slide just covered that, that the book value was 23.9 billion rands, we had 51 in total uh, companies that are listed in this portfolio. I think maybe uh, slide 15, that my father, I think what I'm highlighting in slide 50 um, is just to give the, the committee a feel of where we are in terms of the receipt of audited financial statements, draft financial statement and management accounts. As, as you can see, uh, we are still receiving majority. Uh, if you can list, look at the unlisted debts, we have we still received only one audited financial statement and still 13 outstanding. And these are the companies that we are still uh, pursuing, Chair. And then, uh, Chair, uh, slide 57. Uh, Chair, uh, slide 57, here we are highlighting to the committee uh, the actions that we've taken to date, um, the communication that we've had with both the, the PICCO, the Deputy Minister, to an extent that even the Minister has returned to, to the Deputy Minister, highlighting all the issues that we are facing that are making it difficult for us to to, to resolve uh, the audit findings. Uh, this Friday, we're having a follow-up meeting. Uh, we were brought to board with PIC to address uh, these issues once more, especially where they were not able to meet the, the, the due deadlines. And slide 63. No, let's just go to slide 64. That's my fault. Uh, Chair, what I want to highlight here is, is just to, to give a breakdown to the, to the committee in terms of how far we've gone with respect to um, confirming how much money has been paid to the workers. Um, 2.8 billion rands was paid directly to the workers. 12.6 uh, billion rands we have confirmed via the, the follow the money firms which have been employed and they're able to do this kind of work in six months. And we anticipate that they'll, they are going to do even more work in the coming periods. Asset for Fetcher Unis was able to recover 130 million rands on behalf of URF. Uh, SIU recovered 34 million rands and 2.4 billion rands was paid directly into our accounts by companies who saw court cases happening in the media and they transfer money. Uh, with the follow the money team, they were also able, not only did, did they confirm 12.6 billion rands, but they were able to recover 918 million rands from these companies. Now, if you look at the total, 18.9 billion rands have been able to have been confirmed in one form or the other, either with the assistance of the law enforcement agencies or the follow the money team or the internal team. Now, our engagement with the banks signal that we should be able to recover or to, con to confirm 26.9 billion rands. And that will leave us with about 16.7 billion rands. And we anticipate that the 16.7 billion rands will be pursued by uh, our follow the money team. I, I think Chair, the, the remaining slides, um, these are, are, are covering the areas that the committee <coughs> um, had raised, uh, starting with the, the service delivery uh, project plan. We've, we've given a project plan with timelines. Uh, this is now on slide 70. And then uh, with a subsequent slide giving the breakdown of the time frames. And then also we've given a breakdown again in slide, slide 75. Uh, the committee had requested that we provide a, a breakdown of, of the, the investigation. Uh, maybe that if you can just shoot to slide 78. Yes, I think Chair, just the opinion of this slide, what we're keeping here is what the committee had requested, um, that what were the charges and the official implicated. We didn't provide a name given that this is a public meeting and, and 
there's, there's a risk of uh, unnecessarily um, um, uh, for PR requirements, Chair. And what you've provided as well is a status of uh, of the of the the case. Uh, there's the charges and also the final status of the case. And what I also want to highlight to to the committee is, ah, but is you see, you you will run into that risk of uh, you, as you know we have been dealing with the matter with the NSF this thing of trying to invoke rule one nine eight to the back door of things being held in confidence really just doesn't fly with this committee. Um, so, but uh, I'm sure colleagues will, will will engage with that, but it really doesn't hold water here. But you can continue, but yeah, we can continue. Thank you, Chair. And let me if you can go to slide 82. <laughs> I think, Chair, what we're highlighting in these two slides, slide 82 and 83, we're just confirming that we had nine cases of irregular fruitless and, and, and wasteful cleaner, which has been investigated, there's been con have been concluded, and we've issued um, letters of intent to, to the relevant person uh, so that the, the disciplinary process can start. And Chair, I think the remaining of the slide, Chair, um, it is just giving the committee a feel of the um, cases that were before court. Uh, this is now slide 91. These are all the, the COVID test related cases uh, where our work with the SIU, the Hogs, the Fusion Center, um, the cases that where we've achieved convictions, we are highlighting there. We've also given the committee the case numbers. Uh, slide 92 in the Dimafat. Yes, I think the subsequent slide, Chair, we are giving the case number. We are also, also highlighting uh, the province and the charges that were meted to the individuals. And also that these cases have been concluded to an extent that some of them have been found guilty are serving a prison sentence. I think the, the biggest case that we had was the person who was sentenced to 120 years with an, an effective 20 years to be served in prison. I think for us as an institution, uh, that case was a milestone because it sent a message to, to the general public and those who are defrauding the fund on, on the possible outcomes. I think, Chair, I'm going to, to stop here. All right. <clears throat> All right. Um, colleagues, can we take a compensation fund uh, and then when we engage in questions, we split them. You will direct them where you need to uh, send them. I'm just trying to manage time, if you are agreeable to that. Agreed. All right, thank you very much. That's All right. fine. All right, All right. compensation fund. Uh, thank you very much, uh, UIF. Let's take compensation fund, um, and then we will... We'll proceed after that. Thank you, Chair. I just switch on my camera just for a bit and uh, then also remove it for to ensure that there's uh, no disruption in connectivity. And good morning to all the honorable members. Good morning to the minister and the colleagues. Um, Chair, as I tried to just remove the URF presentation. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the presentation will be an update from what we presented previously to the committee, uh, I think on the 6th of September, our plans and where we are with the plans with regards to um, dealing with all the negative audit outcomes, as well as getting ourselves ready for the audit for the March 2022, as well as the 2023 financial year. 
So the purpose of the presentation is basically then to give that briefing to the committee. Chair, the contents of the presentation will just cover four areas. Right? One around the Clean Audit Action Plan, which is all the work that we're doing with regards to improving the audit outcomes, as I highlighted. Also, just a brief uh, uh, update on where we are with unlisted investments. We gave a bit of more detail than we did last time with regards to those investments as requested by the committee. And also, there was a question asked in the previous uh, appearance around the uh, litigation issues and the costs uh, re uh, related thereto. So we've also provided a bit of update and as usual also then the update on the uh, forensic investigation that was requested by uh, the, the committee. With regards to the Clean Audit Action Plan, just a, a brief reminder of what the of, of what the whole, I think the top part is just a problem statement around uh, revenue, medical benefits, claims, as well as uh, investments. These are the three main areas that have been the key contributors to the negative audit outcomes uh, around inability to provide verifiable employer information on all employers that have been assessed and the revenue that we record in our financials with regards to medical benefits has been the prior medical um, issues around the weaknesses in controls from the prior system, as well as the um, records with regards to that support claims that have uh, the AG has consistently said that the fund has failed to provide to support information that uh, is in the financial statements. And lastly, also the investments. Mr. Marubing spoke at length around the issues that we're facing with regards to, to um, preparation of financial statements that incorporates all the investee companies, those that have, are deemed to be associate companies. And uh, at the bottom of that slide, it just talks to the highlights of the work that used to be done. We previously spoke around the capacitating uh, CF with the adequate professionals, particularly within the financial management space to help us with the work that we need to do to, to deal with prior period issues, working through the data from all our previous systems and the current ones. And also reviewing uh, the current documents to make sure that uh, we prepare for the audit, um, including working papers, reconciliations, and all other necessary documentation that supports the figures that are in the financial statement. Uh, concurrent to getting ready for the audit, also we have um, a process of making sure that we have uh, effective internal controls and uh, an environment that is compliant, uh, that uh, is ideal for a clean audit. So these are all the, some of the activities that I'll touch on uh, later on relating to the clean audit action plan and the key controls monitoring. Uh, and also looking at the ICT systems where there's improvements that are required from a control point of view, as well as from a service delivery point of view, we identifying these and making sure that those projects uh, are kick-started to ensure that we, um, we improve those uh, automated controls as, uh, as well. And all uh, while achieving this also a process of skills transfer to make sure that we improve um, the skills of those that are in, um, in, 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 in finance. So in the, in the next slide, this is just a, the committee would recall that the, uh, we presented the clean audit action plan sometime last year. And this has also then been updated current this year to include the, um, uh, 2021, 2020 financial year audits. And from the month of November, we'll actually be monitoring the updated action plan that has additional um, actions that we've identified out of those audit reports. Um, if I just go to the next slide, so the action plan covers these particular areas uh, across all the line items of the financial statements from revenue to benefits, looking at uh, on the balance sheet, on the provisions, the payables, the receivables, the investments, as well as on the disclosure notes around the regular expenditure, the related party disclosures, as well as some of the um, notes that uh, had found to be uh, to contain misstatements in the prior period years. So this is all the work that uh, the team is uh, is busy with. So while uh, so with the seconded resources that we have, while management is busy working on making sure that we implement the clean audit action plan activities and uh, implement and embed some of the controls that are included in the plan. 
the, 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 the re additional resources are assisting them is making sure that we focus on the specific elements of revenue benefits and investments, as well as prior period errors to make sure that these are dealt with and corrected concurrently. So that when we do produce the financial statements uh, for the period ending March 2022, these are free as much as possible from material misstatements. And uh, this is the, uh, the, the the subsequent slides will then just give a bit of detail as to how where we are with uh, regards to to these elements. So this is just a just a summary of all the activities that we're currently busy with. They can be summarized into three activities. So one is developing and embedding controls, which is what the clean audit action plan is for. And also the monitoring of these controls that we've designed, that we've implemented as part of the clean audit action plan. There is a process of uh, key controls monitoring uh, using the iTrack tool. And uh, so co concurrently with these uh, activities, we also then have the audit readiness activities, which is what uh, is relating to preparation and uh, supporting all the figures that are in the financial statement. If I give it just a, 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 a highlight of, of, of where we are with the clean audit action plan without going into the details, there we are sitting at around 84% of all the activity, activities that are in the action plan that have been implemented. And uh, as at um, the, I think at the time, last time when we reported uh, to the committee, we were sitting at around 83%. And we had about 16% uh, of the activities uh, that were still uh, not implemented. This has reduced also now to about 16%. And the items that were due for reporting a subsequent date that had not been finalized was around uh, about seven or so activities. And this has now reduced around 11, sorry. And this has reduced almost 11 activities. So with the updated action plan, we've closed off on all the activities that we that are forming part of the 84% and the items that were incomplete and those that were due for subsequent reporting dates have been incorporated in the updated action plan, which would then contain only the activities that have been updated as well as those that we could not complete in this particular action plan. Um, this just then gives just a, with regards to the audit interventions and the readiness, so I think the outcomes that we're targeting here towards improving the audit outcome is just about six activities where we're improving controls, making sure that there's compliance with the PFMA as well as the relevant policies uh, of the fund that supports the compliance to the PFMA and uh, the COIDA. Uh, also making sure that we financial statements we produce comply with CRAP improving the document management to support the figures on the financial statements, capacitating our directorates, as well as making the clean audit a daily practice and something that uh, we, we do in all the transactions that we undertake. Um, and this follows then a risk-based approach. And this is just how this slide just highlights the process that uh, the team has been following, which is aligned to how these controls are tested when they are being tested for, um, for audit. So we're also implementing a self-assessment tool, the key, uh, the, the track that I spoke about earlier on, to make sure that we look at um, the compliance levels to the SOPs, to the policies, and where there's been gaps, we identify those so that they can be closed as well. As we embed the culture of compliance to controls, to SOPs, and to, to the policies. Um, and the, the slide just basically just talks about, I think the emphasis is mainly placed on the disclaimer, disclaimer paragraph around benefits, revenue, and investments, while the rest of the, of the areas are not necessarily neglected, but I think most of the focus goes towards this as well as making sure that the systems that support these key processes around revenue, benefits, and investments, that there is improvements around uh, those systems. Chair, if I go to the next slide around the, so part of what uh, has been done uh, around here has been around uh, the, the data cleansing process. So there has been an in-depth uh, data analytics that has been implemented over benefits and revenue to try and identify any misstatements that we may have not reported, as well as any of the issues that um, may require us to correct the disclosures that we've done in the past. So this work is ongoing and um, this would also then go a long way towards addressing some of the um, 
the issues we're looking at uh, document management to address particularly prior limitation of scope findings as well as areas where documents uh, that ought to have been provided were not provided to the AG or documents that the AG would have preferred to have gotten to be able to do their tests where possible to make sure that those documents are, 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 are stored correctly in the systems where there has been disagreements, particularly around engagements with the AG, engagements with National Treasury, and um, where we then need to support our position with uh, specific work. There is also the technical work that is taking place to support our position over why we cannot provide the information that the way that it's wanted, and what are the controls that we've put in place over the information that we provide and in the manner and format that we provide it with. And also looking at uh, around revenue, around supporting uh, the revenue figures with uh, information that could give uh, assurance that the revenue that we're collecting is um, supported by figures. We have appointed uh, audit firms that are currently working through um, our returns uh, database to make sure that we can verify a significant number of, of, of value of, of those returns to satisfy that completeness and control, uh, completeness and accuracy assertion around um, the revenue. And uh, we're also then working through the fruitless and wasteful expenditure around making sure that that is complete as well as it's, it has been highlighted as one of the areas that um, had been lacking in the past. If we look at the, I think one of the, the, the so with, with regard to the status of uh, interventions as well as the audit readiness. So in order to make sure that we prepare financial statements that are materially free of misstatements, we have then um, delayed the submission of the financial statements and the audit to make sure that we can then complete all the necessary work that I've highlighted in the previous slide, uh, around data cleansing, making sure the supporting documentation, all the technical issues where there were disagreements getting those resolved. There has been a number of those that uh, we've had discussions with AG and uh, National Treasury, which we now do in the work to correct uh, where we've now found each other. There are still elements that are still with National Treasury where we're still engaging. Um, I think the issues around investments, we're engaging with National Treasury now on the 10th of November. And we had about two engagements with National Treasury on the revenue issues. And we're now waiting for feedback following the work that they're doing now to try and look at the papers that we've submitted to them. And uh, so with the conclusion of all these activities that should then get us to a position where we're able to submit um, financial statements that are auditable. If we go to the next slide, it's just the bit of more detail around where we are with each of the activities. Uh, with regard to data cleansing and supporting documentation, making sure that all audit information that was requested is submitted. We're currently sitting at around 60, uh, around 75%. When we presented the report uh, on the 6th of September, we we're sitting at around 60% with this area. Around system controls and improvement processes, we're sitting at around 90%. Um, the, when we, in, on the 6th of September, when we presented, we had around 70% with this. So this has to do with a lot of system enhancements that we needed to do on our systems. And um, so this is ongoing. There was a process, a period within which we couldn't do some of the improvements and the issues that uh, were preventing and relating to the licenses has since been resolved. And we have actually continued working now on, on some of these. Um, with regards to preparing the audit files, as well as working through the prior period errors that have been identified by the AG, particularly around benefits and revenue, we are about uh, 75%. Uh, when we presented the last time, we we're sitting around 60%, and we are on track to making sure that we get uh, as much of this information uh, available as possible. Uh, the resolution of the technical issues. Um, so we've uh, I've spoken about the various engagements we've had um, with National Treasury as well as the AG. So we had about 85% when we presented last time. We were at around 80%, and they are still maybe about two sticking points that we're still discussing with the um, with National Treasury around revenue, as well as um, the work that uh, we've been doing with our internal audit, um, 
with regard to medical invoices. Um, uh, so that should, we should have a position around how we deal with it uh, going forward soon. Um, the second slide, the subsequent slides is just the details around how we are um, dealing with each of the issues around uh, revenue and receivables. So one of the things that we needed to deal with around how we deal with estimates for revenue that are raised for employers who have not submitted returns of earnings and how the accounting treatment of the reversals as well as the subsequent payments when these employers do come and pay. At the last meeting when we presented, we had about 85% with regards to the work that we needed to do in this area. We're sitting now at around 90%, tracing all the employer files, making sure that we do a bit of data cleansing to verify the employer information, reconciling some of the information with, um, within some of the databases that we have in-house and also the engagement with National Treasury that I spoke about. Uh, with regard to the statutory um, uh, receivables, this is the rev same revenue that we collect from assessments. There were some accounting issues around the impairments, around the um, accrual processes for the assessments that are not raised. So these were all technical issues relating to the accounting treatment of these particular transactions and the reconciliations are processes that have been underway to try and make sure that we can get the correct uh, compliance to the craft standards, particularly with regards to impairments, as well as how we deal with the uh, um, uh, accruals for assessments that are not raised. We're sitting at around 65% the last time we reported to the committee, we're sitting now at about 75%. Um, with regard to benefits and provisions, we have no evidence to support claims. So this is one of those areas where some of the issues related to submission of documents we are attending to. Some of them, we still maintaining our position around what is an acceptable claim document and how, and the formats within which we've asked the employers to submit information to us. But in those areas where we've seen the need to do some improvements and uh, we have started work around with a comp easy system that allows employers to be able to upload any supporting information with regards to claim. So that work is ongoing with regards to making sure that all claims that are in the comp easy system there is adequate supporting documentation that supports uh, this particular claim. Um, there is also some data analytics work that the team has been doing to look at any possible misstatements that we would have had around uh, benefits and this is part of the generals and the adjustments that will be passed as part of the prior period uh, corrections. We are sitting at around 50% um, with this. That's a lot of work that we're doing here because it contains our entire claims population. Our own provisions for, um, uh, for outstanding claims, there were some issues with regards to some of the assumptions that were made by actuaries with regards to how they've arrived at the numbers. And a large number of this has to do with the claims population itself, with the work that we're doing above, which should then also help to improve some of the, uh, the work that we're doing with the uh, actuaries in this area. Um, with regards to the capitalized uh, values of pensions, we currently at around 50% uh, and 50% as well. Uh, so here is around the pensions that we have to capitalize uh, into our liabilities for future payments. There were some also actual issues that had been raised as a result of some of the work that we had not done on the claim side, supporting documentation, as well as the listings to support the values that we show on our balance sheet. So there has been work that has been done around uh, system enhancements to produce uh, those reports that supports the capitalized values as well as the migration of the claims data from previous systems into the new system so that this information would then be supported by uh, accurate listings. We're sitting at around 45% last time, we're around 40, 50% now. With regards to uh, no supporting documentations for payments from non-exchange, this is the same issue relating to claims, inability to provide listings to support all the figures that were on the financial statements. With the Compasy system, there is now uh, listings that uh, support information relating to claims. There is work that is being done now to try and look at the quality and the completeness of such using reconciliations as well. And there is some data analytics that is being done 
for prior period where we did not use a Pompeii system to make sure that the adequate listings can be produced for, for those figures that we showed in the last uh, financial years. We were sitting at around 35% last time on this item. We are now at around 50%. With regards to investments in associate, so same issues related to the UI, like the UIF, uh, in order to be able to consolidate these investments in associates, we needed financial statements. These financial statements need to have been reviewed for completeness and accuracy. And what we had not done at the time, we had not received most of the financial statements and where we had received management accounts, there was no process to review and verify whether the completeness and accuracy of, the, of these. So there is work that has been done with appointed a, a panel of auditors that are doing high level reviews on the financial statements of uh, these uh, associate companies to make sure that for those that we receive that have not been audited, there is some high level review work that is done prior to us consolidating this into our financial statements. So we're sitting at around 90%. We were, about, we were at 85% the last time we reported to the committee on this item. The contingent assets, these are also a disclosure issues relating to how we disclose uh, contingent assets. Um, so we have been able to get all the relevant documentation that we needed with regard to exempted employers. And we've performed all the asset and liability reconciliations to address the prior findings. So this activity has been completed Last time we reported to the committee, we were sitting at around 90%. With regards to investments in unlisted loans, we um, here is what's issues also around same issues related to investments where the um, valuation issues were uh, a big issue around the valuation reports. Mr. Maruping spoke at length around the challenges that were there with regards to the valuation reports that we've received from the um, the, the, the PIC. So the, the ease assurance processes over the evaluation uh, reports that we're getting from the PIC implemented by the PIC itself on the other side, as well as uh, on our side, we basically also then getting the financial statements to be able to um, do some reviews on the, on the valuations that we have, uh, we have received. We're sitting at around 70% when we reported the last time um, to, uh, to the committee, we were sitting around, uh, I think it was around 50% or so. Um, with regards to the disclosures on risk management, we're sitting at around 70%. And the issue, main issues here was around the disclosure and lack of detailed uh, data on investments that um, may, led to us not being able to disclose correctly and accurately the um, allocation per, per class on each of the uh, concentration risks that had been identified in the disclosure notes on the financials. So we are reviewing this as part of the financials of the 2022 financial year. So we are about 70% complete on this one. With regards to related parties, um, we, so this is also a disclosure issue and particularly around uh, completeness and accuracy of the disclosure of the related parties. So we've done some work as well as dealing with all the technical accounting uh, issues relating to interpretation of that CRAP statement. We've done some uh, data analytics to trace all, any related parties that could be, um, we may have missed in our manual compilation of all related parties. And then we're now preparing the, uh, the notes to make sure that it, uh, from all related parties that you've identified, these can be disclosed correctly. We're around 40% last time we reported, we're sitting at around 50% now. Uh, the principal agent arrangements, this was also a incorrect interpretation of the accounting standards. It was a disagreement for a while with the AG after the conclusion of the last audit report. After several engagements with the AG, as well as looking at the technical issues in the accounting standards, we have agreed with the finding of the AG and we've actually then corrected it as part of the um, uh, corrections that we needed to do from prior period. Uh, from prior period. So we are, almost com we are also complete with this particular item. If I step off the audit items and just go to investments, unlisted investments. So we basically 
providing information around three types of instruments that we've invested in on the uh, unlisted instruments that, that the PIC invests in on behalf of the fund. So first one is equity, where we buy a stake in a company or purchasing shares in a company, or could be through, the second one could be through debt instruments. Either we provide a loan to um, an investee company or we then subscribe to preference shares issued by that particular company which are then redeemable at the end of a specific period in cash. And lastly, we also then invest in uh, private equity investments where we invest in funds, private equity funds. And these are all developmental investments with the aim and objective of achieving a financial return as well as a social return of jobs that are preserved as well as new jobs created. When we look at the, the detail, a question was asked around how far we are in getting all the financial statements from the different companies. So these are the about 11 companies that we actually invested in. Note that Daybreak has two, it was two different types of um, preference shares that we subscribed to from uh, Daybreak in addition to the equity stake that the fund had. Um, so we, to the value of about 518 billion that was invested. The market value is at the end of September was sitting at around 420 million. I'll talk to the differences later on in the subsequent slides. So we have received the um, financial statements for most of them with the exception of um, Fountain Civil, which um, there is some uh, legal um, matters that the PIC is attending to with regard to civil uh, Fountain Civil. Uh, we also then have about two that are in liquidation. With these companies that are in liquidation, it also changes the picture a bit because the reason why we have to then in, to consolidate these financials into our as associates in our financials is because of the deemed um, control that we may have through the PIC on in the operations of this company. But with these two companies that are in liquidation, for example, that control ceases because now the control sits with the liquidator and not with the directors of the company anymore. So in as much as we may have not received the financials, it should also then not uh, impact the consolidation of uh, financial statements into our financial statements. So the rest we have uh, uh, received and we're following up. So some of the companies that have not submitted yet are only having their year end. Uh, much later, the conclusion of their audit process is much later. So we are expecting by end of November to have received everything that is due for all those that are in a position to submit financials with the exceptions of those that are in liquidation. Uh, we then also have the, with the private equity funds. We invested in two funds, uh, the Razorite uh, Fund 1 and Fund 2. We've invested about 1.2 um, billion in those two funds. These are healthcare funds and we still have uh, about 1.2 billion in market value from these two funds. So we have not had issues with submission of financial statements with regard to the private equity funds. Uh, with the unlisted debt, so these are all the companies where they have, we've subscribed to a debt either via direct loans or, or, or subscription shares, or prescription shares, apologies, so, uh, or preference shares. And so th these are, there's about three that are in liquidation, which is LA Crushers and uh, the Wish List Investments and Musa Capital, which is in uh, liquidation also. There should be no uh, control issues here as well because we do not then have any uh, significant control over the operations as these are vested now with the liquidator. Um, and these are, by the unlisted loans, these are all still active. So in total, it takes us our unlisted investments to about 3 billion uh, investments that we've made. And the current market value here is about 2.1 billion. So of the 3 billion that we've invested, we have been able to, in, in the form of either reductions in the loan payments or the payments of loans, as well as um, liquidation of some of the investments in, in a sense that a selling of some of the investments we have uh, realized about 630 million and just over 200 million is those that are affected by the uh, liquidations and business rescue processes. If 
we go to the litigations report, the litigations report. So currently they are, there was a question asked around the litigation. So if we look at cases that are active for, that were active for the 2020-2021 financial year, we had about 124 cases. And the value of the claims from these cases or the, what the, those that took legal action against the fund were claiming was about 142 million. And in 2021-2022 was about 91 cases amounting to about 374 uh, million. If we break this into the two claim types that the fund provides, so we had about uh, 96 cases that uh, were relating to medical claims in 2020-2021 and 38 cases in 2021-2022. And when we look at the compensation claims, uh, we had about 28 cases and about in 2021 and about 53 cases in 2022. Now, these cases and the compensation claims will not have a value because these are claims that would relate either to notices to compel the TG, the commissioner, to adjudicate the claims, to issue awards, or even to set down uh, any objections where employers have uh, objected to the decisions that we have taken, as well as where employers feel that they are classified incorrectly in terms of COIDA, and they are not happy with our position as to how they are classified. So the COID Act does allow for any employer or any claimant who is not happy with the decisions taken either by the commissioner, the DG, or the tribunal to be able to take the matters with the high court. So that's why we also then see some of these cases here. With regards to unpaid medical claims, those would be invoices that have been submitted and have not been paid. If the medical providers also are not happy with the reasons we're providing for why we have not paid and so on. In some of the cases, there would be delays in payment and they would then take the matters up in court, uh, resulting in the payment of these claims where the claims are valid and payable. The costs related to these claims in 2021, we had about 11.6 million in, uh, in, in legal costs. And around 2021, 2022, this was about 10.5 million. The update with regards to the forensic investigations, um, as I draw towards conclusion. So we, the committee recalls that we presented the different work packages that the work has been divided into. And at the time, most of the service providers had just started with their planning stage after having been onboarded. And they were still doing consultations in-house with some of the units to try and understand the landscape and the environment. What it followed then has been most of them have now subsequently developed the, their plans around how they went to start the investigations. So with the first work package around medical benefits, uh, so this is expected to be signed off. So with the initial work that the team has been doing, expecting them that they're expecting to sign off their plan around uh, the 4th of November, which is this coming Friday. With the Second work package around compliance or compensation benefits, which is pensions, temporary total payments, disablement payouts, permanent disability payouts, as well as the constant attendant allowances and federal expenses. So at the time when we submitted the presentation, the play, this was expected to be, the plan was expected to be completed on the 28th. This was done. And this week, the execution of the investigations has actually then started. With regards to revenue from exchange, this was one of the first ones to have started and having finalized their uh, planning much earlier. And this work has already started. They're busy with uh, data collection, collecting some of the evidence and uh, analyzing that information to identify uh, any issues that would then be the focus of the investigations with regards to uh, revenue. With regards to investments, the same uh, planning is completed. The execution has started, so there is those engagements that are taking place between the investigators and the investment team to then collate all the necessary information. Um, with regards to the conflict of interest, which is work package six, this one also the execution has started, and um, the team is also then also still collating information to then try and do a data analytics to identify the areas that would be the subject of uh, focus for the investigations. Um, around supply chain issues and accounts payable, the project plan has uh, is still uh, in, in progress to be developed. 
um, with regards to the financial statements fraud. So this is also expected to be signed off on uh, Monday and following which then the team will then start with the investigations as well. Just a update on uh, disciplinary cases and misconduct cases. This is also one of the questions that have been asked previously by the committee. So we've then provided, I think this just shows for each of the last um, five financial years, the number of cases that have been registered and those finalized in terms of the disciplinary action that is taken, as well as the subsequent implementation of the outcomes of those disciplinary processes. In the subsequent slides, we just then provide a breakdown of the sanctions that were given for, 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 for these cases for each of the financial year. And these range from dismissals, final written warnings to suspensions without pay, um, and, and some of the matters where employees at the time of the misconducts would have been employed on contract and had since exited the fund. So those form part of the uh, criminal uh, investigations with external law enforcement agencies, where there is a case to answer for those officials who will then be dealt with through that uh, particular process. We've got the 2018-19 um, cases also here yeah, break down same uh, outcomes where other cases or other people have been dismissed, uh, written warnings and um, some cases people have then exonerated uh, out of the outcomes of the hearings. 2019-20, We've also provided the, um, the details of the sanctions that were given, same with 2020, 2021, 2021, 2022, same. Um, and then just finally, the update just on where we, we provided an update to the committee that the following the commitment that the minister made when we appeared before the committee in June, 2021, that there would be an architecture review of the mode of operation or the model of operation of both the compensation fund and the unemployment insurance fund. A project was uh, started to do this review and the project commenced uh, this year in March. It is an 18 months project that we're working in partnership with uh, uh, PwC. Uh, so they're looking at the McKenzie, using the McKenzie model to assess uh, about seven areas of the fund, strategy, structure, systems, leadership, staff, skills, values. So they'll develop a diagnosis, uh, an initial diagnosis of the challenges, as well as a plan, the development of a plan to be able to address those uh, weaknesses that they've identified or even strengthen those uh, strong areas that have been identified out of their assessment. So where we are with regards to that, we are currently in the seventh month of the 18 months uh, project. The work that has just been completed now has been around phase one, which is the initiation as well as the initial assessment. We call it the SE's assessment across strategy, technology, business processes, human resources. So all that work has the assessment has been done. We've just finalized the adoption of the assessment uh, SE's reports. And the next phase that the project has just entered into is the strategy building phase, which is now mapping the recommendations and focusing on the capability mapping, looking at the operating model of the organization, the functional structure, as well as the leadership structures that we need to have. And also looking at out of the skills audit, uh, also looking at the findings and the recommendations that would then need to be implemented as part of the subsequent um, phases. This is an 18 months project, but as at the conclusion of phase two, in fact, out of phase one, as well, there's already a few recommendations that have been made that we need to consider for implementation concurrently with this project. And at the end of phase two, there will also be those um, improvements that uh, would come out of those that we are able to implement concurrently and those that we may not be able to implement until the conclusion of phase three uh, of the project. Chair, I'll end my presentation there. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much um, for those presentations, right? Colleagues, uh, questions? Uh, colleagues, all right, Honorable Liz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm gonna try my video, but if 
people can't hear me, please let me know. Good morning to you and good morning to, to everyone present. Um, as Chairman, uh, you know, listening to the presentations, one gets the impression we're listening to presentations on brand new organizations with no history. It's astounding that we, we're hearing about all these, we want to change crap, we want to do this and we want to do that. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, it's just plain unacceptable. The annual reports are due by a certain date and they must be done. Um, and, and, and I am concerned about the Auditor General's role here. And, and I'd like a comment or a reply from the Auditor General as to why, when the deadlines have been reached and management letters have been issued and responses have been considered and so on, is the annual audit report not simply issued and tabled in Parliament, as the Auditor General has done in the past with SAA? Why is the Auditor General allowing entities such as the, the Unemployment Fund and the Compensation Commission to just drag this out indefinitely? Audits are done at a point in time, at the end of the financial year. That is when the audit is done and the assessment is done. And it's not an opportunity given to the auditee to go away and fix a whole lot of stuff before the audit is completed. That then, the fixing is allowed with the management letter if there's some errors of judgment on the part of the auditor. But it's not a time to go and fix things. So for the comment to, to be made that, you know, once we've got all these things in place, we'll be ready to, to complete the, the audit and submit the annual return. Mr. Chairman, I, I just don't accept that. And I hope that my colleagues don't accept that. And indeed, Mr. Chairman, I would say we should be at the point of charging the accounting officers for delinquents in this matter um, and including the DG of the department. And, and, and so, Mr. Chairman, you can hear, I feel very, very strongly about this. National Treasury have now issued a, a what is directive or note about these annual reports. We try to get a private member's bill, which was then rejected in um, a couple of months ago, to deal with this very issue. But it just goes on and on and on. So, Mr. Chairman, I don't think I need a comment from the, the auditees here, but I really do think uh, and we can get a comment from the Auditor General about why after the, the due process is done, the audit reports are simply not tabled and, we, and the Auditor General continues to, to negotiate. Mr. Chairman, let's get to, to the unlisted investments. It's again, a similar picture. We're going to do this, we're going to do that, and then we'll finish the audit. But I'm astounded that we, we're talking about changing grab standards. We're talking about management accounts. Surely we've learned some lessons from Steinhoff and Tongart Hewlett, where even audited financials were fraudulent. Now we're having some sort of assurance program with management accounts? Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's, it's completely astounding that we can even think of going down this route, let alone say this is the answer to these delinquent companies and, and investments we're making who can't even produce proper financial statements. And we, as you could see from the figures, investing huge amounts of money there. And who knows? Are there any jobs created by this? We say that's our objective, but who knows? You're looking at management accounts, pieces of paper drawn up by the very people who might be committing fraud. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I don't know where the Auditor General stands on this matter as well. The, these unlisted investments, loans, and et cetera, um, are out of control. And the question really is, why are the commissions, the Unemployment Fund and the Compensation Commissioner, dealing with these annual financial statements and reports from these investees, which is really what the PIC should be doing. The PIC must be held accountable. And Mr. Chairman, I think we really need to pull the PIC into this debate. These investments are done by the PSC 
on a mandate from the, the commission and the fund. The PIC must get these things in line. They must get the reports. I'm not understanding why the, the, the clients, being these two entities, the fund and the commission, um, are, are not holding the PIC to account um, and ensuring that if they don't get the required documents or audits, that the investments then are withdrawn. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would really like us to call in the PIC to answer those questions. Um, Mr. Chairman, in terms of, of the Compensation Commission, in our last engagement, I, in answer to my question, I think it was Mr. Mafata, um, said that entities such as sole traders, co-ops, and so on, could register online. Well, Mr. Mafata, if it was you, it doesn't work. But when you get to the end of the registration process, you get an error message and says, this company cannot be registered online. The only companies, the only businesses that can be registered online are those registered with the CRPC. So how is it possible for you, whoever it was, I think it was Mr. Mafati, to inform a parliamentary committee that it is possible, whereas in practice it's not possible. The facility is, is there, but perhaps we should go through an exercise and do a dummy registration while we are in the meeting and see how, what happens. Mr. Chairman, so I'd like some comment from, on, on that, on what the registration, online registration per, process is, is doing right now. Um, the Comp Easy system that, that, that the, the commissioner has referred to, um, there, there's, the, it seems to be a bit of a, a, a xenophobic thing. The, the, we clients are being required to produce um, the the work permits and 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 passports etc. Whereas there's no legal requirement for that. So, can I get some explanation as to what is the legal basis for requiring these documents when dealing with foreign employees? Then the question of Compizi again, the, the bank details of, of registered employers has not been uh, migrated, I think is the word, to the Compizi system. And it takes months and months to get the bank details um, entered into the Compizi system um, through the whole process that now has to be followed. Why is that the case? Then when claims are paid out by the Compensation Commission, there is no detailed remittance advice with the payment. So the person receiving the payment, the employer or the employee or whoever it is, doesn't know exactly how that claim was adjudicated. How was that amount calculated? On what? But in the past, in the old system, one used to get that detailed remittance advice. Now, apparently, you don't get it. Um, Mr. Chairman, there's been quite a lot of, 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 um, of media coverage to the, the visits to various uh, farming enterprises, particularly in my own constituency, um, by, regarding um, the adherence um, by, by employers, farming employers, um, to the various laws. And, and, and that's important. Uh, that's very important. But what I would like to, to ask, Mr. Chairman, through you, and not as a question to be answered orally here, but can we get a report from both the Compensation Commission and the Unemployment Insurance Fund as to what the status is now? So what I'd like to receive is what is the total number of employers registered in the agricultural sector and give us that by by category in other words um, they must have categories of what type of farming and and how many of those are up to date with their annual returns and payments 
So if we could get a, a report from both, both of the entities before us today on that, please, Mr. Chairman, I, I would be very grateful because it's an issue that we need to ensure that these employers follow the law and, uh, and we need to see whether it is a massive problem that we as SCOPA also perhaps need to, to get involved in, or perhaps not, perhaps it's not that bad. Um, but we, uh, we, that report would, would highlight that. And Mr. Chairman, you raised the issue of, of, of um, the so-called yeah, confidentiality. I'm, I'm, I must support you there and say that that's just not on. Um, so thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, for your indulgence. Right. Uh, thanks, Mazamban, um, for that. All right, let's take Honorable Mente and then get responses. Um, and then we'll go to the next set. Uh, just note all the questions that have been asked, and then if there's follow-ups, the members will raise them. Honorable Mente. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Chair, please uh, allow me not to put on the video. Um, no, that's perfectly we, fine. We know the status of our network. I'm on orange as we speak. Yeah, Chair, I, I have an interest on the UIF document, which uh, tells us about the SIU investigations and the steps taken by the department thereof. I would like to get extra information because as things stands on the document itself, it says uh, these companies group them together and then a senior manager or someone or something like that. Honorable man, are you there? Honorable man, there? Oh, I'm muted. Sorry, Chair. Okay, proceed. I'm trying to maneuver in between documents. Sorry, Chair. Uh, okay, and then on the document, the explanation is grouping the companies, and then it gives us an official responsible for all companies. It doesn't give us an official pay company. And what's interesting is there are two officials. I don't know if it's the same person who received a month, a sanction of a month's salary that they are not going to get. And then the rest is final written warnings. These are the people that the SIU has found guilty of a transgression, which is serious in saying there is a sole provider for a certain service, which was not true. That's fraud. That's criminal. And then a DC finds the person warning. Let's just say it's okay because the labor law is complex and all that. Did the department open criminal cases? Because you can't have a senior officer breaching all the laws of the PFMA and have an accounting officer which, uh, and, the, and the accounting authority, which on section 38 and section 51 is clear on the roles and responsibilities of these two, that there was criminal intent on the side of those that have transgressed. I want to understand, do we have criminal cases against such officials? If not, why? 
because I guess they are not going to be able to answer for the DC and its outcome, which is actually very undermining. It's it's a it's a just it's playful. How do you give a final written warning on a person who takes companies and say these are sole providers? You are literally creating work for one company over the others. Thank you, Chair. All right, all right. Let's get uh, responses uh, to those uh, two questions, to those two sets of questions. My one question, uh, Minister, uh, maybe this one is directed to you specifically. When we met last year in May, June, we spoke about the perennial disclaimed audit outcomes and or adverse outcomes jointly and collectively of the UIF and the compensation fund. And the committee directed that a forensic investigation must be done on in those spaces because of the disclaimed audit outcomes some of which go on to almost 10 years successively, uh, either interchanging between disclaimed or adverse, but in that poor space. What is the progress in that regard? I think the, 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 in the final analysis, we, 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 we need to get an update on that. How far is the implementation of that committee directive? But let's get uh, responses and then there'll be follow ups. Over to you, Minister, and your team. If I can step in, I'm sure the minister was, will then also respond, Chair. Can I proceed, maybe, Chair? Yes, yes. Can you continue, Mofat? I'm sorry, uh, Chairperson. Um, I'm multitasking. I'm dealing with the sensitive issue of the the conciliation at the at the PSCBC. So can you start, Mofat? Thank, thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to the honorable members for the questions. So I'll respond to those specific ones related to the CF. Chair, maybe just one correction on the issue of uh, financial statements by the investee companies. The issue here is not about their inability to produce financial statements. The issue here is around the timing at which they produce the financial statements versus the timing within which we have to produce our financial statements. There's always that differences in the year ends, which um, either requires us to wait for them to be com to complete their audits, or if that uh, runs, uh, gets us into the risk of not completing our financials on time, hence we said the reliance on management accounts, but we then do the necessary reviews on those financial accounts using auditors to, uh, would still then go back and check once the audited financial statements are done, if there's any material uh, differences between the final audited financial statements and the final financial statements that we used for the review chair. So it's not necessarily about the fact that these companies, these companies are companies in good standing, uh, are op in operational and are producing the relevant statutory uh, statements that are required as, uh, by law. Chair, the issue of uh, sole proprietors uh, from honorable lease. Um, so chair, the system is working. Um, if there may be an individual matter that relates to either how the providers are, are, are populating the, the system or could be an individual issue relating to a verification of uh, the verification of uh, the verification of, 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 of that particular person's ID and so on if he's a sole provider but uh, the system is working we know of no significant issues or challenges with regards to uh, to this in fact, 
in our drive to get domestic employers also to be registered. Domestic employers have been using the same system and have been able to successfully register uh, themselves on the system. With regards to the comp easy, so as part of the controls required right, for us to implement controls over claims that we adjudicate, South African citizens, we have an automated control in that we able to validate any ID directly through the population register from the Department of Home Affairs, but passports issued in foreign uh, countries, we're not able to validate it because there is no authority in South Africa that is uh, maintaining a database of foreign passports. So as a result, that is why as an additional compensating control over the fact that we don't get this from Home Affairs, we then require these documents from claimants who are foreign nationals. So it's in no way a discrimination, but more a control or a compensating control to address a uh, deficiency that had been identified in our claims processes in the past. The issues of banking details that have not been migrated, we do have instances where employers' banking details have not been migrated, and it then has to follow the process to get it updated on the COMPEZ system. And in some cases, it then uh, causes discomfort over employers because they're not happy over the turnaround times around how these banking details are updated, but we do then do those updates. The issues around um, remittance advices. So that also is not correct that there are no remittance advices. After every payment run, there is remittance advices that are sent to um, medical service providers after the payments. And where medical service providers requires detailed line items for each of the items that were paid, they then also able to request that information because that is a more detailed and more voluminous return that uh, we don't necessarily auto-generate in the system, but is provided on request. Here is the challenge that we do have with remittance advices. The fact that medical service providers would use one third party today and another a year, few years from now. In some cases when these changes do okay, or even when they employ people, and those people um, leave the employee of the company, that information doesn't get updated with the compensation fund in terms of the email address and so on. And the system will continuously send the remittance advice to the last known or last submitted email address. So if a person has left the employee of a medical service provider or you've changed a, a, a provider who submits claims on your behalf, if that information doesn't come to the fund, such medical service providers would obviously not get any returns. Um, and we do then update those if uh, service providers come forward and say, I've not received my return and we realize that the email address is incorrect. We then provide it, but for the detail that is requested, and then we can provide it. Um, okay, I'll leave it there and then just give to Mr. Marupi. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, um, I think let me start with the one on the report on the agriculture sector. I think, Chair, we, we can make this report available within the next seven days, Chair. We'll package it for, for the committee and send it through. <coughs> to give uh, feedback on how many uh, in the agricultural sector are registered declaring and contributions and whether they are up to date or not. Um, I think, Chair, I'll need to be assisted by the meeting with, with respect to the confidentiality in terms of the names of the people. Um, I, I have the names available in front of me. I can give them now to the committee. I just need the committee to give me guidance with respect to the fact that it was a an employee relations matter, I don't have consent from these employees and I might interfere with their right to privacy. But, but if the committee allows me and give me guidance, I can keep the names here and now, all the names of the people that were affected by the SIU investigation. I have them, I can make them available or I can send the report after the meeting. I'll be guided by, by yourself, Chair. Chair. Just one second, Minister. Send us the report. Because the report is final. Yeah. And then we will, yeah. But I think what I was cautioning you uh, uh, against is the, the assumption that there's things which it must be dealt with Nicodemusly. 
these reports are about public funds. So send the report so that it's not an extraction and we'll look at it in, in its holistic, uh, 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 you know, reality. That's fine. Okay, Chair. Minister, you are coming in. Yes, the the AG is I haven't forgotten about you. I know there's a question that you must respond to. Minister? Yes. Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable with uh, that uh, response from yourself that this disclaimer with the commissioner is putting. Uh, we we can't be afraid to give the report. We will give that report. And with these qualifications, which we're talking about, hoping that uh, we will be protected because we are in a very litigious uh, uh, country. People can take us head on as long as we will be protected by, by SCOPA on this matter. Secondly, you've asked a question in relation to the investigation. Unless I'm wrong, Chairperson, the investigations in relation to the UIF, that's what we left them to the SIU, the Hawks, and the whole Fusion Center. And uh, there were thorough investigations which were done, uh, including, uh, I don't know the methodology which was used by the whole Fusion Center on the management of uh, of the UIF, who came back with a report to us uh, in the main, uh, not flagging any criminal things except uh, the issues of uh, negligence and so on. And I think uh, some of those officials, we were able to clear the commissioner and uh, the COO there's a process uh, which is being followed in relation to the CFO. That's that's what we relied on. I don't remember the specific forensic which had to be done by us, but all those investigations were done by the SIU, the Ops, and the whole Fusion Center. I might have missed that one. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, you might you might have, but I'll pull up the the records, Minister, of that. Um, to remind you, um, right? So I note that, I'll, but I'll, I'll, I'll pull it out. Um, if not now, I'll send it to you in writing um, on that one. All right, Honorable Liz, before I come to you, can we conclude the, the responses and get AG to respond to the question you put? Sure. Um, okay. Um, uh, good morning to yourself, the honorable members, uh, the honorable minister, um, the colleagues from both the funds and the department. Um, I think honorable Lise asked a question on why, um, why is the AG allowing the entities to continue uh, working on the management report and correct the matters while they have not yet uh, tabled? And why are we not following the route we followed on, on um, SAA in terms of tabling for them? Um, and Chair, I think for, 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 for the AGSA, yes, you, you have noticed that over a period of time, we, we, we have started to really table where the NTT is delaying the process. But with UIF and Competition Fund, they have not submitted the financial statement for 21-22. So we have not done the audit per se. I think you would have heard the commissioner, the two commissioners speaking to the intention to submit on the 31st of March next year, which means that there will be a year or they are a year behind all other auditees that we presented through to, to Parliament. So in a nutshell, there has not been an audit as yet um, for, for the year that they are, they are speaking to, which means that there isn't anything for the AGSA to, to conclude on. Um, may I just pause there um, for now? Thanks. Okay, uh, there's the responses, right? Honorable Lise. Mr. Chairman, my faith in the Auditor General is is once again restored. I I, uh, I really was under the impression that at very least something had been sent through for audit. So, 
I, I mean, it just reinforces my view, Mr. Chairman, that the delinquency of the two commissioners and the DG here is very serious, very serious indeed. So, um, you know, what, what they're dealing with, what seems to me to they're dealing with audits from years. They haven't even sorted those out. They haven't even started any audit issues for the for the year that finished in in um, March, April, whenever it is, um, 2021. 22, sorry, 22. So, Mr. Chairman, it's just, it's, it, thank you, AG, for, for that. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it might, that might help us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I am, um, yeah. Uh, for your, I mean, I, I don't often say this, but that's obfuscation. Well, how did you go to great lengths to report to the committee about using management accounts, et cetera? And now you come along and say, well, actually, no, everyone's producing financials. It's just the timing that's the problem. Um, I, I'm really baffled for you. I, I just, oh, Mr. Chairman, we need to get clear, clear pictures about what the, uh, when we get these reports. We can't be told one thing and then if five, 10 minutes later be told, actually, no, we're getting all the financials. We don't actually need the management accounts. I mean, what, what are we being told here, Mr. Chim? It's, it's, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I'm angry. Thank you, bye. All right, um, yeah. There's a phrase I'm trying to find. Uh, it's a lot of word salad. I think that's the phrase. I'm not sure if the, it's the phrase that pays, but it's a lot of word salad. Um, yeah. Okay. Let's 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 do this, colleagues. I think maybe what might be helpful here is moving forward is to separate uh, hearings or meetings of UIF and compensation fund, meet with them individually so that we can unpack in greater detail Vatran um, An and Vatran Ni Anni. Um, because it, it, it seems as if, and to agree with the Honorable Lisa, it seems as if we are dealing with totally new entities that have got no history or past. They are just being established. And, and I'm not certain that uh, the consequence management that has been meted out is consistent with what is at stake or what has happened historically and currently. Audits are outstanding. Um, yeah. I can only conclude by saying we've noted what has been said. Um, Minister, I will communicate with you in, 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 in writing on the issues that I've raised. Um, and we will engage with the SIU uh, uh, and the anti-corruption task team or the fusion center um, on the issues that they would have been dealing with. Um, and I think maybe uh, colleagues is to prioritize a follow-up visit to the compensation fund uh, and the UIF when time allows. Um, of course, parliament is rising early this year when the 1st of December will be done. So. There might not be an opportunity for that, but I think at the earliest possible convenience for the committee um, is to have this one-on-one -on -one engagement. Because what I, I don't get a sense that things are moving with the particular agency and seriousness that is required. And it seems as if we, we're having the same conversation every time the two entities appear here. Um, 
yeah so quite quite frankly i yeah that's what i'm saying it's a whole lot of word salad um in these presentations that have have, have been given here and i think that's precisely why the entities are where they are um, okay so i think we can we can leave it at that and say this is real no, I'm something it's in Lalilu Tassin Zwang. Yeah, it's in Lalilu Tassin Zwang. That's the phrase I wanted. Okay, uh, Minister, let me thank you for the update. We will interact and engage, um, and we will engage with the AG. I mean, you see now, if you want to be. Uh, uh, your outer date is what the 30th or 31st of March for audit purposes. That's the end of another financial year. So that yeah. will mean that will mean two two audits would have to be done now concurrently. Yeah. So it yeah, yeah it, it's a bit worrying. Uh, no, no, not a bit worrying, it is worrying. That yeah, it's worrying. But as Prime Minister, let me take this opportunity to thank you and your team um, from compensation. Can I say just one word, Chair? Yeah, of course. I'll give an opportunity, uh, Minister, to okay. conclude. Um, and I think we've heard what you've said, Nora. We've listened to what you've said, and we will look at it again, and we will communicate in terms of where things should be and how we see them, and get further briefings from the other um, stakeholders whom were involved in this. So I'd like to take the opportunity to hand over to the minister for concluding remarks. And then colleagues, we will be meeting with the National Treasury at half past 11. All right, Minister, over to you. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, I, I have indicated at the beginning that um, Shortly, we are planning to meet with the whole management of the two entities and SCOPA, I mean, and uh, AG. And I request, I'm happy that uh, Habu is here also, and we have agreed on that. And I request you, Chairperson, together with the team to consider this if you cannot call us to come and report about the progress after that meeting and the timeframes we might have put in place together with the AG and the milestones. I wouldn't mind that you call us even before the end of the year. Uh, I would gladly do so. We must give it a push. That's something which I'm, but to go and consider that chairperson together with the committee. Thank you. No, Minister, that's fine. Um, let's 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 give you that opportunity to have that meeting with AG team, um, and then we. I think what we'll do, colleagues, on this one is to get monthly reports. So today is the first of. November. Um, so let's get the first report end of November, and then we'll report in that fashion on, on progress. Would, are things moving? We will engage with the AG as and when is necessary to ascertain whether the necessary cooperation is being received. Um, because yeah, if we need to keep you on a short leash, then I think that's what we need to do. So let's get that... Uh, um, those those reports. So give us a consolidated report of how things have moved in between now and the end of the month, and then at the end monthly reports until uh, we meet. We will prioritize a visit, and um, yeah. But I, Minister, I I conclude by saying the following: the people who are at the forefront of an in inverted commas, fixing the problems, 
have been the people present when the problems occurred. That irony on its own tells us everything that we need to know and everything that we see. And I always maintain the phrase, shape up or shape out. I don't think the former has found expression. And so really, the latter is what must be at the forefront of your mind, Minister. Maybe on reflection, I can only put the question, are the people you are working with fit for purpose? I doubt. That's my worry. So it's fine, Minister, we'll get that um, report. So the meeting you'll have will AG. That report will be included in the monthly reports on the progress on the milestones. And then we take it from there. Minister, thank you very much. And we also understand, of course, that you are settled with two ministries and departments at this point in time. But thank you for your presence, uh, as always. Colleagues, thank you very much. Let's stand by Tinaga Scopa family, take a 10-minute comfort break, and we'll start promptly at half past 11 with National Treasury. And I did see that um, the, the report was sent or the presentation. I think we'll deal with that aspect first with National Treasury. Uh, before we proceed. All right. Thank you very much, Minister Siatawa Zakulu, um, Commissioners and the team. AG, thank you very much. We'll be in touch. Meeting on this part of this morning stands agenda. Thank you, Chair. Moloini. Triple S. Moloini. Regan Vacom Tato. Bonjour. Guten Tag. Aye, that that was a disagreeable chat, and you have a gene of Pinu chat.
to um, frozen Mr. from Mr. national treasury okay Mr. good morning good morning minister hello samus villa chairman yes really bab yes really come on yes all right colleagues uh, let's carry on with our second leg of the meeting this morning um, we've just come out of employment and labor on matters of the compensation fund and the uif uh, minister good morning to you and your team and i'd like to welcome good morning chair like to welcome Auditor General as well. <clears throat> so the meeting this morning is on really part and parcel of the committee's SOP uh, as and when the speaker receives requests for late tabling. We prefer that request to be ventilated as opposed to just taken on the basis of correspondence. So there's a late tabling of the 2021-22 uh, annual report of National Treasury. Um, now, Minister, I'll start off with uh, a gripe first. Okay. okay. We received your presentation mid-meeting of the meeting we had with Employment and Labour just before 10 today. Having been notified last night at 6 o'clock, 6, 6 p.m. that we'll receive it this morning. Of course, it's a five slide presentation. So some would assume that, okay, fine, fair enough. But just as a matter of principle, to receive documents late makes it impossible for members to prepare adequately and correctly. And it's not something which is we take kindly to. And members have raised the matter very sharply with me this morning during that meeting. I don't think it's correct. And I share fully uh, in their concern and outlook. So I, I thought I should raise that uh, matter first because even yesterday, I checked with the Secretariat. Has National Treasury submitted anything? No. I'm not sure there's an, there's an echo somewhere, whether the feed is on the end or... Remove this. Right. So ben, can you mute persons who are not speaking? Because, yeah, all right. Yeah, so I just I, did. All right. Thanks, BK. So I think that's the, 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 the issue I wanted to, 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 to start with, uh, Minister Uti. It might, it, it might be a five-slide presentation. That's fine. Uh, but when we, if we start airing on the side of quantity, then it, it's, it opens a floodgate. So members have, have asked me to raise that. Um, and I'm sure that in the interactions, they will raise it themselves. As, as, as well. So I think colleagues, let's um, hand over to the minister uh, and his team uh, in providing an explanation uh, to us as to why the is a late tabling of the or non-tabling rather of the annual report for 21-22. Um, colleagues, are we fine? Yes, thank you. Right. Agreed, Minister, agreed, Minister agreed. over to you. Thank you, Chair. Let me start by apologizing for what you have said. The, the, the staff will, may have to... There's an echo. Let me just change. Laura, I'm still speaking. Can you guys not make a presentation? Sure. Can you can you hear me now? Yes. 
First, let me apologize for the these slides. I also do not agree that the slides must should have been circulated today. Um, uh, I apologize for that, Chair. Uh, I agree with you at least this, this, where there is five slides that should have been made available at a reasonable time. Uh, they will probably explain to the officials. The second point I want to raise is I had to submit a letter because by law, as the executive authority of the department, if they are not tabling, even if we're tabling, I'm the one who tables. Uh, so if, if they are not tabling, I've also I've got to say we're not tabling as executive authority. But I've not come uh, closer to the uh, deliberately so be in touch in involving the dispute between the off uh, treasury and the and the AG. My role was to table the to this uh, to the speaker as required by law. I will ask the relevant officials led by the acting DG to explain what the problem is and 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 leave it at that level and and be at the disposal of, of your of you chair and the committee. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> well, that's, that's perfectly fine. The acting DG can uh, 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 come in. Okay. Uh, morning, chair and yeah. honorable yeah. members. members. Sorry, we're just trying to remove the echo. Okay. Uh, and and uh, Apologies, we are having these technology challenges here, but we are all sitting in the same room. Uh, we have uh, Laura and Semi here, Stadi Mogozulu, and Sandile, uh, our CFO, Mamela, here. So we'll, we'll send you the names, Chair. Um, uh, and the ministers with us. Excellent. You may suggest uh, and chair, let me start off. by apologizing for uh, the late submission of the slides. Uh, it's not an excuse. They are merely speaking notes uh, to to present to the committee. And uh, I, I apologize that we only submitted it uh, this morning. Uh, Chair, maybe to start off, uh, and I don't know if you can see the presentation. I mean, let me start by saying, you know, I'm happy that the committee has called us up because I think like the committee, Treasury certainly strongly supports um, DG, can I ask you to can I ask table you to on turn time, off your, that DG. there not be delays. And as we all know, in terms of the PFMA, uh, the minister as the executive authority is required to table it by 30th September uh, of every year. And we certainly are committed to that. And for important reasons that, the, you know, the PFMA deadlines not only promote transparency and accountability, but it then enables parliament to exercise its oversight function and to hold us to account. So uh, clearly it's, 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 it's very important. And for me, it's one of the most important provisions in the PFMA. Um, I know very well before when we did the PFMA, it used to take uh, some departments wouldn't submit at all or for years later. Chair, and there are many bad reasons why people may not submit, uh, but sometimes I think there are uh, uh, good reasons why there, there, there's a delay because the audit process may take longer if there's disputes between the auditor and auditee, even when the financial statements have been submitted in time on the 31st of May, which is two months after. Uh, of course, there could be other reasons as well that people may have delayed on submitting the financial statements. It may be weak or poor financial management uh, I would argue that the last two reasons are certainly not the case and that the process of auditing does allow for 
uh, dispute resolution and we are try and we've been working uh, um, feverishly I think with the AGs we've had with the AGs with the AGSA team we've been working feverishly with them even whilst we've been busy with the uh, medium term budget policy statement to try and resolve issues um, uh, but yeah the, all the issues are not as yet resolved next slide please so, Chair, let me just for the record say that the Treasury uh, and as the accounting officer, we submitted the financial statements on the 31st of May. So it was within the stipulated deadline. And then the AG's team provided Treasury with their findings on disputed matters from 8th of July onwards. And we received the first draft management report on the 12th July, 2022. And as we've been going to and fro, the latest request for information was also received on the 21st of October. Chair, we don't want to preempt the audit process and put our views forward when clearly the AG has not commented. Uh, uh, so I, I don't want to go into any detail on what the disputes are. But let me just say, broadly speaking, the issues relate, uh, you know, that there have been changes in the audit methodology compared to previous years that we've had to deal with uh, in the dispute. Uh, there's also how certain specific uh, payments have been dealt with in, in spite of the fact that they've been appropriated in most cases and also the approach to contractual commitments when payments are made for projects like IFMS. Next slide, please. So those have been broadly the issues. And Chair, let me just point out that, you know, there's uh, the Treasury audit process is a complex exercise in a sense that, you know, we play three different roles. Firstly, we're a department like everybody else. We get our budgeted amount, it's vote eight, and we have to account for how every cent is spent. Uh, and, and certainly the AG audits us like they do with all departments. And this is what this audit process also covers. But we also have two other roles, which the auditors have to deal with. Firstly, the treasury is obviously the treasury of the national government, similar to, I say, the provincial treasury of the provincial government. So we deal with allocations to national departments once we receive the, the equitable share uh, that, go, that goes to national government. We are then responsible for allocating to the different departments. And the third role is a much broader role that we play, which is in line with Chapter 13 of the Constitution. I think it's Section 215, uh, where the Treasury is the Treasury of all three spheres of government, we have to administer the allocations, the equitable shares to the three spheres. We have to set norms and standards. We oversee the National Revenue Fund. We issue guarantees. There's a lot of provisions like that, which other departments don't do. And the Auditor General then also audits for these functions. And some of the disputes, I guess, relate to some of these roles that we play. Um, the, because sometimes the audit process, it tends to traverse all three roles, even though there's a separate process for the NRF and the consolidated accounts, where it's the accountant general who becomes the, the um, accounting officer for those funds. Uh, next slide, please. So, Chair, just in terms of the rules that we have currently or the agreement, is that when the audit process, as the the auditors, um, the AG's office response, and they relate to where the dispute relates to accounting standards or interpreting national legislation, then the auditee, uh, not just a national auditee, I think it's, it's any auditee, uh, can refer the matter to the office of the accountant general of the national treasury. And the accountant general, obviously, in that capacity, it doesn't act as as the official of the treasury, this is for any department. And when it's the treasury too, they then meet with the AG and the officer of the accountant general, they support and as technical units, they engage 
uh, with the technical audit support division of the AG. And if there's still disagreement between them on the application or interpretation of the standards or legislation, then uh, because the process is documented, then there's particular engagements or consultations with external parties, including, for example, getting a legal interpretation from an, an external party that's been agreed to. And thereafter, the joint consultation is communicated to both the auditor and the auditee. And one hopes that these processes are completed. As we speak now, Chair, we, we met with the AG's team. I think the last meeting we had was on Friday. Um, our audit committee has been kept informed. The chair has been kept informed. There's also been meetings. And uh, and we we referred, uh, there's, I think of all the issues, there's, there's one issue that's outstanding, and that's been referred to the accountant general again. We're hoping that it will be, uh, uh, well, well, that that process can be concluded uh, in the next day or two. Uh, that's my hope. Uh, whether that happens, I think, uh, you know, we can't say because it depends on, 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 on whether the two parties reach agreement. Uh, Minister and uh, Chair and Minister, I'll, I'll stop here if there are any questions on the process, but that's just been the process which I would outline. Uh, I've tried not to touch on the issues, Chair, because I, I, I you know, uh, but I'll be guided by you. Uh, on the uh, on 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 if you if you need any more information. Okay, um, thank you uh, very much for for, for for that explanation. But the issue is that we are quite au fait with the legislative guides and the processes because, as I said. This is part of our SOP. If departments, entities submit that they will be tabling late, we have an engagement on the why, in as much as it may be contained in the, in the, in the letter. You will recall we've just dealt and are continuing to deal with the road accident fund matter, amongst others. We've dealt with TATC um, on quite a number of substantive issues the list is long. So I think substantively, I think what we want is why you did it. But let's go to Honorable Somi and then Honorable Lise. Well, well th th thank you very much. Uh, th thanks to the, the active DG. Um, well, morning to the minister and the team. Um, my, my chair, uh, colleagues, is on the list of things that uh, uh, the active DG has made reference to. Uh, it, it looks like as included in that list, as we stand today, we are on the uh, 32nd day of treasury failure uh, to table or, or the minister's failure to table uh, the report something which I think we must rebuke um, uh, because Treasury ought to be exemplary um, in all forms uh, that relate to financial accountability. Uh, the, their failure to table um, in this instance seemingly is based on three areas which have been highlighted uh, by the acting DG. The third area, which is IMFS, um, happened to be a, a matter which has been handled over time. Over time, I mean uh, that uh, this, this process has been there since 2013. Uh, 2013 in terms of the cabinet resolution. And, and therefore, all financials uh, from then would have carried that point looking into uh, their implementation table uh, of the uh, IMFS. And, and, and therefore, uh, one would then get some form of uh, being attracted into an interest in as to what is it now that comes sharply 
as, as something which is contested when it comes to uh, matters that relate to um, that, that, that area. Uh, I understand the two others uh, uh, are part of the areas that relate to what, what the activity has referred to uh, uh, in, in, in terms of dispersing some uh, uh, amounts finalized as per certain programs uh, per se. Uh, that's, that's, that's one area which I would want to someone get into because this, this item uh, has, has as well been there even in the previous, in the previous audit. And, and uh, uh, as part of that uh, as well, one would get to sitting on that, on that, on that area alone, um, as we're trying to check whether the, the minister found time to respond uh, to the minister uh, of, of public service uh, administration correspondence, which was making reference into the same, same matter. Uh, um, I think it was January, uh, if I'm not mistaken, at, at this year, um, uh, in, 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 terms, in terms of uh, uh, looking into uh, that, that area that relates to the integrated uh, fi finance management uh, system, because primarily that, that department uh, uh, has been part of the team which has been looking into the success uh, or failure uh, of that uh, kind of a program. What is it now, concretely, that is making Treasury uh, to be bogged down into matters that relate to uh, uh, a such item uh, in as far as the uh, audit process uh, is, uh, uh, is concerned? Uh, th thank you very much, Chair. Honorable uh, list and then honorable mentor, and then we'll get responses and then come back for a second round. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to put my camera on just briefly so that, uh, hello, Momo, we can see each other now, just um, so you can see me. You might have forgotten what I looked like. Um, <laughs> it's great to see you, Momo, but um, somewhat of a disappointment, the circumstances under which we chat to each other again after quite a long time. Um, it seems to me that Dondo should be here, given that um, he, uh, he should be taking the flag for, for, for the unfortunate um, circumstances that National Treasury um, finds itself in. Um, but Momo, I know you're very competent and uh, I'm sure you'll deal with it um, with your normal finesse. Um, it seems also to me, Mr. Chairman, and to Momo, that um, I now understand why Dondo opposed our private member's bill that dealt with the late submission of, um, of annual reports a couple of months ago, um, uh, just before he left, uh, a week before he left. But there it is. Um, the, the question really then, Mr. Chairman, is I think you've, you've mentioned it, um, but Momo and Minister, we, we actually probably need to know a little bit more, well, the actual details of why the, the, the report has been delayed. So if it is the disputes, what are the disputes? And if, Momo, the disputes have largely been dealt with and there's only one issue left, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure that, that it would be greatly helpful if we could get details of what these disputes entailed but even the one that's not yet, not yet, um, not yet dealt with. Uh, hopefully, there'll be agreement in the next day or so, as you say. So, Mr. Chairman, it's nice to see an old friend, but the old friend has got to answer some difficult questions. Thank you. It's uh, honourable mentor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair. It's, it's, it's one thing to account, is then it's another to smoke screen. 
One, I am not sure how you addressed the letter from the office, um, from your office chair to National Treasury in terms of today's meeting. One, on the, on the matter of the late submission of uh, their presentation, as much as you have addressed it, I feel like you've, you've gone on it very diplomatic. It's not acceptable because as Scopa, we don't listen to people's presentations. We read them for ourselves in order for us to understand and not be thrown off. We can read, internalize, and do our own investigation in order for us to be productive. Number two, I am not pleased with this uh, five pages that were given. Because in a way, they are very condescending. The first thing is they are written like you're writing a, a, a message to a friend with so many acronyms. A, a, a very short-handed writing presentation. And the first second thing on this presentation, it just it's now lecturing us on the processes of auditing between the auditee and the auditor. The mere fact that we serve in Scopa is because we know that. And the mere fact that National Treasury has to come here is because we know there is a dispute between the two. All that we expect is not us to be lectured on how the process of auditing works. We want to understand why has National Treasury has not found or agreed to the findings of the Auditor General and why the dispute? What's the dispute about? That's what we want to understand. And then number three, in understanding that dispute, according to National Treasury, I heard Babu Som, you're calling it an item or an issue. According to Auditor General, there's a disagreement and a dispute on the issues of um, irregular expenditure and uh, fruitless and wasteful expenditure on the IFMS. As far as we know, me and you, Che, I think with also Babu Lis, we have dealt with the issues of IFMS far back in the previous parliament. There were forensic investigations, there were people that were found to be uh, on the wrong side. There were serious allegations and the serious transgressions on the findings of that uh, forensic. And in, 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 in fact, one of the people who were found to have transgressed in that IFMS attempted to apply to be an Auditor General and was disqualified in the process of being an Auditor General due to that finding of the IFMS forensic report. Now we want to understand where is National Treasury standing and what is their understanding of the IFMS and why are they not agreeing with what the Auditor General is saying so that the Auditor General can tell us what's the way forward from here. We can't be lectured, Che. That's what we need to know. For the acting DG to say he's not going to get into the matter, in fact, we called you here to get into the matter, not to lecture us about how the ODT and the auditor process allows. We know what, the, what are the privileges of every department. And you are the custodian of all these laws, especially the financial laws of this country as well. Thank you, Che. The Honorable Mentor, yes, just for clarity, in the letter uh, I indicate, following an introduction, that National Treasury is therefore requested 
to appear before SCOPA to give an elaborative explanation of the non-tabling of the report. SCOPA is aware of the minister's letter to the National Assembly regarding the report. So I thought I should just indicate that the request was for an elaborate explanation uh, to the non-tabling. And that's why I indicated to the acting DG that we are aware of the legal prescripts. The issue is substantively why and where are the areas of dispute. Uh, and I think just more pointedly is whether the, the processes of the dispute resolution mechanism have been uh, have, have run their course to a logical conclusion. So I, I think that is substantively the, 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 the issue. So let's hand over to National Treasury and we'll come back for a second round of questions. And I want to hasten to say, Minister and Acting DG, that we, that National Treasury rather, is held to a higher standard. Uh, than any other, insofar as compliance is concerned. And this does not mean that you've not complied. The, the prescripts of the law allow you to engage in the processes that we are in now. So um, take it in that spirit. I'm, I'm, I'm not casting an indictment on non-compliance, but I'm saying national treasury is held to a higher standard. Uh, as the custodians of the PFMA, as the ones who are the torchbearers, and as the ones uh, that will issue treasury notes and regulations and guidelines and so on. So it does raise our, uh, it draw attention when you don't table, simply because you're on a higher pedestal. So I think you, do need to delve into the merits and demerits as to why you've not uh, tabled so that there's clarity and understanding to avoid the precedence. Because non-tabling really, whilst provided for, in our view, is not a norm. It should arise in extraordinary circumstances. And we need those extraordinary circumstances now ventilated here and explained. They have to be rational and reasonable uh, so that uh, we understand them to be a genuine application of the law. Over to you, uh, Minister and D Acting DG. Okay, the Minister is asking me to respond first. He'll, he'll respond after. No, no that's perfectly fine. Okay, no, no, thank you, Chair and Honourable Members. And Chair, I agree with you. I think the National Treasury must be held to the highest of standards. Uh, uh, I think that that is right for the country and uh, right for the National Treasury. And we need to be an example to all others. Um, uh, and, and, and that's why, Chair, it is painful that we are late. But I think the issues are important. And perhaps it, you know, let me say... Uh, you know, right up front, uh, uh, I certainly don't want any blame to be attached to our previous DG, uh, Donna Mokayani. Uh, and, and, you know, he's been out of this process. Obviously, he was there when the financial statements were submitted. But, uh, and, and I, I would uh, really say that I don't think he was taking any position about tabling or against legislation. Uh, in fact, we were broadly supportive of that legislation. I think it was just an issue of how. Let me just say what the issues are. I think that when the, the issues came to us, we've said to the AG that, for example, if there's a change in methodology on how guarantees are treated, guarantees are treated every year for many, many years, I understand, they've been treated in the same way. This year, there was a different approach taken, and um, we were only alerted to it then in July. So then we had to explain that when we issue uh, guarantees, 
uh, there were issues of related parties and and how and 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 so it it was an extremely technical issue and that's not to say that we don't agree with uh, a, a new interpretation on an approach say on guarantees that these could happen uh, 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 but it helps if we have sufficient notice beforehand uh, when these changes are made in methodology. Um, so that was the one issue is how we recorded guarantees. Uh, I, I should add that we've come to an agreement on that through the dispute mechanism. It was referred and there was a positive outcome. And I think the Treasury's view prevailed, I believe. But again, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty because some of them, are, it's, aside from being extremely technical, I do want the AG to, to be here and uh, uh, to provide that perspective so we can both say these were the issues and this is why we differed and so on. The second issue related to payments, and these were of appropriated amounts, so the amounts to SASRIA and the amounts to GPF. And there too, there were issues about how they were reported. Uh, uh, and again, extremely technical. The issue was never that these amounts have been uh, uh, paid out and in fact, they've been appropriated. But I think in the one instance, the SASRA appropriation hadn't been done. So again, the issue was about how we had reported on that. I'm going to ask our CFO to come in if I'm wrong, because I'm, I'm not an accountant chair. Uh, so my, my accounting is dangerous, but uh, uh, he, he can explain uh, uh, what the issues are, okay? But again, I think those two issues, the way I understand it, they've been resolved uh, by and large. Um, uh, I'm gonna come to IFMS. Uh, I just wanna check with Sandile. Those were the two well, what, is there any other issue that I'm missing aside from IFMS? GPF and SASRIA. And what? And the guarantee. So I've raised them. And again, Chair, I can ask them to provide more information. Should you want, they can go into it in, 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 in much more detail. But I want to just give a flavor that these became very technical issues. There was no dispute that... Uh, uh, you know, the money didn't go or there was anything suspicious, anything like that. It was just how it was reported in the financial statements. And as I said, our view was the AG had suddenly changed their methodology without notice. And, and then it gets reflected into our, the Treasury's own uh, uh, audit opinion and management report. The last issue, Chair, is, 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 of course, a difficult one of the integrated financial management system. And I'm not aware, uh, Honorable Somio has talked about a letter in January. I'm not uh, aware of that letter, so if he can elaborate uh, uh, on, on that letter. But I think that the IFMS issue has really dogged our financials. And, you know, when the minister asked me to be the the acting DG, it's one area I would like to clear up. And let me say for the record, fortunately, I've had no involvement with IFMS, so I don't have any issue to raise. But when I look at the issue, I do feel that, you know, this was the IFMS attack. And, and I'm not saying this just so that I want to shift blame. I, I think in spite of the source, I mean, it was the Gupta Channel A and 7 which launched an attack through a leaked internal audit uh, unit report in 2017. And yes, there have been countless investigations because, and I think the, the, those were right, because the Treasury should never have anything to hide. And, and you know, it first went to Deloitte, then there was, um, uh, what's it, Nexus, uh, then the Hawks were investigating, the SIU is investigating, the public protector was investigating, and of course it appeared in the Zondo Commission. And there were lots of affidavits uh, uh, presented by former DGs and so on. And to this day, Chair, let me say that I haven't seen any evidence of even one cent being stolen or spent 
badly. We can disagree on the on the process, but nothing has emerged. Now, that's not to say that when the other investigations are completed, they may come up with something. I don't know. But until they do, uh, 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 nothing has happened uh, in that sense or nothing being revealed. The problem we face, Chair, therefore, is that the implementation of the IFMS, which is really an important project, has actually been seriously delayed. And so the whole dispute then relates that there's a contractual agreement that government has entered into with Oracle. And what happens is every year when a payment is made of, say, 68 million rand for maintenance and support, uh, the AG has, has said that uh, they've not been used and therefore it's fruitless expenditure. The problem we face now, Chair, and, and, and we are looking at renegotiating the contract, but uh, to the extent that payments have been made, if we don't make a payment, uh, it's almost that that too could result in fruitless expenditure. So it's become an issue. And what we've, what, what we've done now is to try and see what the accounting standard that should apply and what should be the basis on which um, uh, it's deemed to be fruitless or irregular. And if you, and, and these concepts, I think, uh, let me say just as a separate exercise, and I don't want to bring it into our audit, I think are not standard accounts and do have implications, I think, on whether we deliver or not, because we can't, if we were to abandon IFMS, the state would face legal consequences. Uh, and those are all the edges that we're going into to try and see what's the issue forward. Because I can tell you, even next year when our financials come up, if the current approach is maintained, it's going to be fruitless. If I don't pay as an accounting officer, it's also going to be fruitless. And it's not that there's any money that's going to any official of the treasury or that's been misappropriated. It's in terms of a contractual uh, uh, agreement. Now, uh, the, the whole issue I think that's come up therefore is what's the way forward on IFMS? And it's a discussion that we are having. And as I said, we are trying to renegotiate even with Oracle so that hopefully we meet with the concerns of the AG. But we do have differences both from an accounting standard and the way certain payments have been treated with the interpretation of the AG, which I think needs to be resolved if we're going to produce this. Otherwise, we are chair getting perverse outcomes, that, uh, which, which I believe is a problem for accounting officers. I can easily, as an accounting officer, yield and say it's not my problem, it's my predecessor's problem. And... Uh, uh, and, 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 and look good in a way, yes, then we will have a further fruitless expenditure. It gets referred as a multiple irregularity. The, the question comes up uh, that even if it's fruitless, what consequences can there be? Because it's not that you can, uh, the, 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 the payment was not made from a contractual perspective. And uh, the, the, uh, the, and certainly in government, we don't want to send a message that we don't honor our contracts. We try and renegotiate it. So I didn't want to get into the detail of IFMS. I think we've appeared, I know as Treasury, many times before SCOPA on this. And I do think that we need to find a way forward in government. And as whilst I'm the acting accounting officer, I've said to the minister, we have to resolve this, this issue so that it doesn't dog not just Treasury, but is holding back the whole of government. Uh, the systems that we use are pretty old. Um, uh, uh, but uh, let, me, let me stop there. I don't know, Sandile or Study or Laura, if you want to add any, if I've got all the technical points, uh, I don't know if the chairs can't see you. Let me just, are you happy? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, the minister wants to come in. You'll get onto your computer, minister. Let me, let me, uh, 
Let, let me echo your sentiment, uh, Chairperson, that Treasury cannot afford to lower the bar. I agree with you on that, on, on, on that score. And it is my intention that it should not do so. That's the first point. The second point I want to make is that like the acting DG, I'm new on this debate. Even my interpretation may even disagree. Chair? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, Minister, there's an echo. Yes, we can't hear the minister at all. Someone in their, in their office, their mic is still on. Right, Minister, try again. Uh, I'm, I'm trying, trying to get them to switch, switch off. off. Yeah, they switch off you. And no point can show you how to. Must club and parties. They yeah. must also lower the volume. They must mute. Their volumes must be off. Okay, they are yeah, sorting, yeah, well, well, sorting it out. Well, 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 let me just say. Uh, there's no one who can query your comment and your and your expectation about us, and we happily submit that we are correct. And Treasury cannot afford to lower the bar. That I agree. The second point I want to raise, like the acting DG, I'm new in this IFMS issue. And as a result, I'm going to make two points or two or three points which in those three points, I may probably not be on the same, they may not be on the same page no, with me. No, Minister, uh, 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 we're not winning, eh? The echo is providing terrible feedback. Yeah. yeah. Can everyone just switch off? Yeah, can, can you hear me now? now? We can. can. We, we, I, I can hear you, but the echo is still there. But let's proceed so that we can manage our time. No. We're, we're trying to switch all of those computers. Yeah, let me start. I'm start. I said, Chair, we respect your 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 comments about your expectation about treasure, and I'm saying your expectations are correct, and we cannot afford the lower the bar. We make us submit ourselves to that. The second point we're making, I'm also new, like acting DG on this FMS thing. So, so I may, I may make, make comments which may not necessarily even agree with them. Let, Let me just say, the way, way this thing was reported to me, it was an agreement by cabinet that, that three departments must work together on this issue. Your, your first problem, which is dogging the, this issue, it seems now those three departments are not on the same page about the continuation of IFMS. That's my reading, at a distance and new. And, and that, that has got an implication on the implementation. Uh, because in order to provide for the rollout, you need to have an, 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 a service provider. And to get that service provider, it's got to be done by one of our assistant departments. And who are not committed on the project. So, 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 CETA has got to make sure that they provide us with, with a service provider in order to roll out. But because we're not rolling out, uh, then AG says the, the cost we're incurring for maintaining all of these things without a rollout may be irregular. That's simply my own reading at a distance. Uh, so it's bogged down by tension between these two departments. My undertaking to the committee is the following to you is the following. We will, I'll make sure that before the end of this financial year, that that impasse is resolved. 
so that we should be able to continue. Um, they know I've already set up a meeting with the relevant ministries and their technical teams. Uh, when I come back from the G20, we would have had that meeting in November and make sure in this month so, and make sure that we can resolve this impasse because it's not only that treasure alone, but we, we have got partners. Uh, it's a pity the letter referred to by Honorable Somio. Um, I've not been uh, able to see it. I've been trying to re try to talk to people to look for it. I can't find it. Uh, but I'll make it my business to, to, to look for that letter. But as I'm saying, Honorable Members, the issue is what complicates these issues. For me, I'm not talking about the technical audit stuff, which, which I'm not involved I'm not involved with. You will understand how we operate in finance is that the corporate service, all of it, is delegated to DM, correctly so, because if they make their budget, I can't be part of making the budget of national treasure and then make a submission to myself. So to avoid that conflict of interest, that's how it's is traditionally national treasure is structured. So the day-to-day -day operation of the departments are largely DM's uh, function. And therefore, I couldn't even in, in take, take part or discuss between the National Treasury, the dispute, and, and AJ, because I want to still continue my neutrality on these issues. But this issue of the, the difference between the two, the three departments is a matter that I think it should be resolved uh, in November, not in any other month, so that by the next financial year, we're not bogged down by this issue. That's my commitment to, 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 to you, Chairperson, and, 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 and honorable members of the committee. Thank you. Okay. Um, on, thank you, uh, Minister and Acting DG. Um, Honorable Mente, uh, Honorable sorry, sorry. is your, is your okay. hand new or is it a historic hand? No, it's, no, it's not it's a historic hand. Wait, wait, wait. wait. It tries some sand. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, one of the things that I want to say is a connectivity challenge. And yes, we are going to ask a question and come to you. Honorable Somio. Well, thank, thank you very much, Chair, for that concession. Uh, thanks uh, to the 18th DG and the Minister on their responses. But if, if I look into uh, the provided program schedule, uh, termed high-level match stones um, of the same program. It has got three phases. First phase ends 2015. Second phase ends 2017. Third phase ends 2022, which is the closure uh, of the entire program. Is that program in existence? Are you anticipating closing it come December? How much have you paid so far for it if it exists, for it if it not, does not exist? That's the same contention expressed in the letter addressed to the minister. That letter is signed on the 28th of January, 2022, uh, at the time when the minister was your self minister. And uh, that, that letter was signed by then Minister Roger, where she expresses the withdrawal of the department because of the delay of implementation of that program, where she gives the reason, which flies exactly on the AG's accession, that now that program is sailing deeply into the wasteful and fruitless expenditure. She uh, cites the amount involved, which for her, she was totally against uh, uh, that kind of a conclusive results. And the standing question is, if you don't want that to be classified as wasteful, as fruitless, where are you currently with that program? 
because the closure and the actual spread of the success of the program is supposed to be 2022. Though we know 2020, there was already in December some form uh, of a failure in dissemination of one of the critical uh, instances of that uh, kind of a program. Where are we? So that we don't debate the weakness on project management, we make it a financial program. Because that's where we are. So your failure to submit sales on the definition problem, which you subject other departments to and other spheres to. Your comment. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Mente. Chair, can I answer to that? Then I'm coming in. But colleagues, let okay. So let's get a response. But I, I, I want us to to take the outlook that we need a full presentation on IFMS in all its material realities, because there's something that the the the, the, the acting DG has said, and I'm mulling over it. And it's these payments. If you pay them, it's wasteful expenditure. If you don't, it's the same thing. I'm just trying to grapple with that notion in my head. Which can be quite clearly, where are we uh, with, with this thing? Because I, I, I remember this IFMS things in the fifth parliament when I was still a member, even before Terry. And here we are still talking about the same thing. It's, it's the greatest indictment, if not the greatest failure of implementation in the financial management space of this country. And it's bleeding the fiscus. It, 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 it's just inconceivable to me how we arrive here. You know, it, it's the same thing as Midupi and Gusile. Just open-ended, payment upon payment. It just, it's a revolving door. So I, I think the three departments, we have to have an engagement with them in one room. But I think more pointedly, the question, after all this is said and done, when are you tabling your annual report to parliament? That's the issue. When? So that we bring this matter to a conclusion. We need to know when that report is being tabled. Because even the dispute management is not open-ended. It has to arrive at a logical conclusion of some sort. And then we deal with it on the basis of what the conclusion is. The negotiations and the discussions and engagements are, 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 are not alive to, you know, eternity. So I think honorable, let's get responses to that, and then honorable mentor will come in. Acting DG. Okay. okay no. Thank, thank you, Chair and honorable members. members. The ministers asked me also just to reply to these questions. I think, I think uh, Honourable Chair, you know, you touch on really the, the core issues and the frustration, frankly. I think what the ministers touched on, you've got three different departments or entities, and the accounting officer is only the Treasury. So if others don't do it, the Treasury gets blamed in terms of the actual uh, uh, funding uh, accountability. And... Uh, uh, that, 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 I think, think structurally is a, is a problem. Um, but let me just provide the better news, because I've shared, and the DG of the Treasury is also the 
chair of the steering committee of all these entities, and we've had a meeting, and we have been told that the, that letter from the previous minister, minister is in the process of being withdrawn. And Chen, this is a problem. Every time there's a new minister or new head, you know, uh, uh, there's a change in approach, and yet we have a contractual commitment. So, you know, honoring contractual commitments from your predecessor in government is, is really a fundamental rule, unless you're going to take steps to, to change it. So, so from the steering committee, and I think the next step is the meeting that the minister refers to, that the three ministers will meet, and try and resolve. I've also asked the question, Chair, that just given that when you have a procurement, what's the role of the executive authorities or ministers as well? Because all of those things, in a sense, come to play because this should be just about implementation. And let me say that I've also been told that there were three tender processes and we have to do it through CETA and all three fail. So the project actually is stuck uh, and, and one, one of the things, things Chair, that the ministers asked me to look at is how we modernize our, our procurement system for infrastructure and so on, because whether it's Madupi, Kusile, or IFMS, we're having these problems. But I'm going to ask Laura just to go into, I think, the, the, the I'm, I'm very impressed with the memory of uh, Honorable Somio uh, and uh, I think, and, and I'm glad he's holding us to account and he's come with the three phases and the three deadlines. And and those have been revised, but let Laura come in and she'll provide that information. Good afternoon, Chair, and good afternoon, Committee. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, yes, in fact, we have uh, re-baseline the project uh, we, we did it uh, during the course of the financial year, uh, in fact, prior to this financial year. In terms of that rebase line... Prior to the financial year that ended, what year? Yes, 2021. Okay. Um, and that uh, rebase lining is reflected in the MT, uh, MTFS with a final rollout date for the entire IFMS 2024. So, so what we should have done for this year in terms of our uh, milestones was critically to appoint a service provider through CETA and, and then to uh, establish the four pro uh, pilot projects, uh, two in the provinces, two in the departments. Unfortunately, as the acting DG has indicated, uh, we have attempted to appoint a service provider through CETA uh, three times. Uh, our first attempt was in 2018, uh, 2017, 2018, uh, and we have not yet been successful. Our, our uh, attempt during the, the, the financial year that is under audit uh, was that, unfortunately, the bids the bid that was received was significantly higher than the budget uh, that was allocated, and therefore uh, we were not able uh, to appoint. In order to address, we've, we, we are putting in place significant measures as Treasury, because as the acting DGs uh, indicated for us, uh, modernizing and automating our financial systems, not only to address the aging uh, systems that we currently run, but the reality is that in order for us to implement the recommendations from uh, the number of commissions that we had, particularly uh, the, the Zondo Commission around um, better, uh, more stringent procurement monitoring. We have to update and modernize our, our procurement system so that we can integrate our reporting and produce a more intelligent reporting. So in order for us to be able to do that, we've, uh, we have engaged with CETA. One of the things that we have requested CETA was for, uh, for uh, the appointment of the service provider given that we've had, we've attempted three times uh, to be done by Treasury as opposed to uh, by CETA. Um, we are engaging with Oracle um, in respect of the support and maintenance. Uh, the Chen Committee will know that the purchase of licenses was a once-off payment that was done in 2016. The issues at hand is the support and maintenance that's been paid. So we are engaging with Oracle. 
um, in respect of that support and maintenance. But equally, we're looking and have engaged with other entities and departments as well as provinces to be able to bring um, residents' uh, skills to develop the, to, to, for the required development that we need to start the rollout. Um, and we have, in fact, started that process with the Western Cape. So we're looking at a number of mechanisms to address um, the delay uh, in, in the IFMS. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. So, Chair, just to conclude, and the question that you asked, I mean, uh, the, the two issues, I think we would welcome providing a more detailed input on IFMS, I think, after November when the Minister has had the ministerial, because I think the issues are that more fundamentally that we got to we, we, we got to we got to get these issues resolved and the, the project implemented or not and uh, uh, and the contract negotiated uh, renegotiated because frankly to now implement something that was supposed to be implemented in 2017 even the contract needs to be uh, updated because technology just overtakes one. Uh, so and 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 we are having those discussions uh, with the providers. So in, in in line with the current contract, we're trying to see you know what what we can change within the rules um, to to modernize. In terms of the annual report itself, the question you asked here. Um, so we were going to have another meeting with uh, a unit at the AG this morning. It's been the, the date was changed, so hopefully that will be later today or tomorrow. And if the issue is resolved, then we can move with speed. If the issue is not resolved, Chair, um, then we do have to take a view and and. Uh, 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 about how, how we then resolve issues because it's going to come up next year as well if it's if it's not resolved. Um, so, so I don't have the answer if that's the case, case but I can we, we can inform both yourself and the minister the, the outcome of our discussions uh, before November the fourth uh, to 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 update you on on, on where we are. Uh, but the hope is that we can resolve it and 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 uh, have the annual report issued in the next week or two. I think the minister had committed to the 4th of November, but it's dependent, as I said, on the outcome of this process. Okay. Minister, do you want to come in? The resolution of the matter is not based on the book. It's based on the project, the realization of the project. And, and if, the, if it's not realized, it's going to arise every year. It's wasteful. It's fruitless expenditure. All right. There's no other way. Okay. There's no two ways about it. Okay. We, I think we are all in agreement with that, that this can't be a, a revolving door. <laughs> can, I, can I come in? Okay. Uh, hey. yeah, well, just, just stand, stand by. Minister. Yes, Minister. Yeah, you know, I wanted to respond to Honorable Somio and say that's precisely what I'm saying is that we, I've got to find a resolution of the project before the end of this financial year. I agree with you that because if it's not resolved, we're going to have a continuation of this problem. So um, that's why I said I'm making an undertaking to find a solution on the resolution of the project moving forward before the end of the financial year. Thank you. Honorable Mentor. Chair, I went back to the minutes of 2017, and now again, the minutes of 2018, and the minutes of um, earlier, I forgot uh, the year. All these minutes, 2017, we're moving from IMF 1, 2018, we're going to IMF2. There's Oracle, there's everything, there's money flowing all the time. The previous uh, DG was explaining how the money was flowing, which uh, the lady was saying here. 
And now, no one from National Treasury has given us an explanation or a reason that is clear as to why do they say it's not fruitless and wasteful expenditure? Why are they disputing the AG? That's where the matter is. And the matter is clear, as Ubabu Somio is saying, is based on the IFMS project, which is not delivering or giving us any fruitful results at this point. The only thing we do, we pay, we maintain, we hire service providers, we do everything. Even with the forensic outcomes, forensic investigation outcomes, no one has been taken to task. So if you don't take anyone to task, it means you disagree with the, with the, with the, with the investigation. And therefore, you brought on board people whom you don't have confidence in. That's wasteful expenditure. The fact that you can't charge anyone out of that investigation is wasteful expenditure. The fact that you continue to bring other service providers on board on a system that is not delivering and is result, there is no value for money at this point. It's fruitless and wasteful expenditure. Give us a reason that says it's not. That's what we want to hear. Right now, we are not being sold anything saying we disagree with Auditor in general on this basis. We do have value for this money. It's not spent in vain. Perhaps we need to go to those simplest uh, uh, terms. Was the money not spent in vain? Or is there value for any money that has been spent thus far? And I'm just talking about since 2017 up to date. And if Auditor General is making this finding now, what was the finding on, on this particular project in the previous years? And what was the standing of the National Treasury? So we can't be sitting and wasting time in check. It's fruitless and wasteful expenditure, period. Thank you. All right. The, here's the, 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 the crux of the matter is this. Uh, acting DG. We are increasingly getting worried at the extent to which there are delayed, delays in submissions generally. And now these disputes which are you know, arising. Because we will end up with negotiated audit outcomes. And that is not ideal. That's the only warning I want to give. Because that will come to you. That headache, if it becomes a precedence entrenched, will be your headache. So let's wait for that meeting uh, between yourselves and the Auditor General. And then we will devise a mechanism on this IFMS thing so that it can actually uh, find expression anew in the parliamentary process. with all the relevant departments, so that even these newfound sentiments of withdrawals of letters and outlook and so on and so forth, whatever it is, that is the new reality is explained and then bring this matter, uh, close it. But you see, you're not going to find joy at CETA because CETA in itself has got its own headaches. CETA is a headache on its own. So you can't expect a headache to solve your headache. <laughs> um, there's just no, you know, and, and, and Minister, I think, you know, the executive must look at this. 
the collapse of or, or problems in one entity either sets into motion a domino effect, which is a stumbling block to other things, or it stops other processes. So there has to be functionality in every space in order for there to be functionality and coherence in government. So this IFMS uh, thing, as I'm saying, for me, it's a case of deja vu. It's exactly like Medupi and Ngusile. The deadline is always being moved outwards, re-baselined, reconfiguration, new terms of... So let's get responses, uh, Minister, uh, from, from yourselves. Uh, and then see how we, we take the, 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 this, this forward. But I share wholeheartedly the sentiments of, of colleagues. Minister, over to you. Uh, I, I think there are three issues. The first one is the tabling, which was said we'll table on the fourth. We'll come back to you after the meeting with the auditor. That's the first issue. The, the second issue is the the overall presentation you, you want on the history of the project and, and the cost, which I think we should be able to provide and explain those costs uh, to you. I think we need to do that. The third issue is the overall resolution of this problem department, which I undertake to lead and make sure that it happens. Uh, and I've been grappling with this, uh, with a thousand other issues, and this one is also my headache, uh, honorable chair. I then say, on the basis of those three approaches, uh, would like us the, the like the committee as to give us time to do those things, and and come back at the appropriate time uh, back to the committee, chairperson. Thank you. Okay, um, that's perfectly uh, fine. I think what we will do, uh, colleagues, is we'll have to run this thing parallel. We want uh, the report, uh, and I'll report a conclusion to this audit process, and then there's the IFMS uh, pandemic. Uh, because what really is, would be of interest is how much you've spent on it and how much of its total uh, reality have you used. Because, you know, so there's all those variables. Um, and then we will take it from there. Uh, I'm not sure, colleagues, because our program is tight uh, and Parliament rises, well, the National Assembly rises on the 1st of uh, December, um, but I think it would be correct that at the very least we get a full briefing on IFMS before Parliament rises. I think that would be correct because the responses we've received here, none of them even are not in writing and so on. There's no brief on it. There's nothing. It's good that some insight has been shared. So let's let's um, we'll find a date, uh, Minister for National Treasury uh, in one way or there to come and brief us um, on that so that we, we are brought up to date with all the material facts uh, of where things are now and we get time to study the documents, numbers and, uh, and so on. And then we take, it from, we, we take it from there. So, and then we would like a, 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 a response uh, on when you're submitting, you had said the fourth, but that seems to be moving. Can we get a updated then commitment date uh, on that by close of business on Friday uh, so that we can also be able to report to speaker that we are dealing with these matters uh, and so on so that everything is up to date from our side. I think we'll find a date, colleagues, to get a substantive um, briefing on IFMS 
Uh, and then with all the relevant stakeholders, I think public service and administration uh, critically must be there and CETA in whatever form, shape CETA is currently. And then we, we take it from there. So let's look for a date. Uh, Sister put pen, let's, let's find it uh, and, 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 and deal with it. Uh, colleagues, are you good with that? Thank you, Chair. Okay. Oh, sure. Thank you. All right. So, all right, Honorable Minister, let me take this opportunity to thank you and your team for being here uh, this morning uh, to explain and express yourselves on the matters of the uh, 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 your non tabling and, of course, the matters of IFMS. Uh, and I think that it does not need. Uh, it cannot be under overemphasized, rather. It cannot be overemphasized that oh, National Treasury is the torchbearer of compliance. And so you, 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 you are well aware of where things uh, are. So I'll hand over to you, Minister, where if there's any concluding remarks with the just the, the, the conclusion on our side that can we get the updated timeline of when you'll submit uh, to us by Friday, close of business? And um, then we will look at when we get that briefing before Parliament rises in terms of where things are with IFMS, the numbers, uh, and so on and so forth, the re-baselining, the whole nine yards, uh, so that uh, when we resume with work, we just hit the ground running uh, next year. So, Minister, over to you. Uh, I must also, also like you, uh, uh, Honourable Chair, thank, thank you for uh, this, this opportunity, opportunity and, and the discussion and and the, level, the, the frankness with which you have confronted these issues. Uh, we thank you for, for that. I don't think even from our side, we, as we have indicated, we have anything to hide. Um, we will do everything possible, and we appreciate also the progress, the, the process that has been outlined. And I think the acting DG will come back in terms of the if there are any changes from the fourth. And we, the tabling of the IFMS to you, we would prefer it just towards the uh, the last two weeks of, of November because we want to. I'm going to G20, which may make it difficult for me to do some, some of these meetings before the 16th. So I'll uh, appreciate your, your giving us that time towards the end and explaining all the detail. I think we need to do that. And by then we'll also combine, we'll also combine it with the outcome of the discussions with the different departments. So we'll make a combination of a, a presentation which allows the history we want to know about the project together with the progress we want to do moving forward. But thank you to you, Chairperson, and the, all the honorable members of the committee for that. Thank you very much. No, thank you uh, very much, Minister. I think because uh, on the 22nd, uh, Minister, your team is due to brief us on Treasury Note 3, uh, the changes that were made there. Maybe we can then, oh, I almost use a phrase which, deal with two beds with one stone. Uh, oh, um, and then to get this briefing um, from, from, from National Treasury uh, insofar as, as that is concerned. I'm sure we can reconfigure uh, ourselves then so that it, it's not multiple meetings, omonye pez gomonye kind of vibes. But uh, yeah, so on the 22nd, we've got that briefing on Treasury Note 3. So let's maybe then look at that date just to get an update on IFMS. Colleagues, thank you very much. Tomorrow we are receiving a briefing from the Auditor General on the state of affairs of the SOEs. Um, and we will be starting at uh, half past nine uh, tomorrow morning. Colleagues, thank you very much, uh, Minister, Acting DG and um, AG. Uh, uh, thank you very much. The meeting stands adjourned. Happy and blessed Tuesday. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> We're <laughs> passing <laughs> up. Thank you, Marcela Iperia. 